Hello, beautiful people. I am Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, joined today by a whole uh, by scads of uh, programmers and IT people. Uh, and the subject of our discussion this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, will be programmers and the possibility, I would go so far as to say, the uh, overwhelming likelihood that they form a new elite scribal class. I don't mean to make too much of them, but uh, I hope to uh, explain that position and to discuss it further with these gentlemen as we go forward. Um, before I introduce all of them, I'm gonna do the boilerplate stuff. Please follow this channel, Semiagog, as well as a safer space. You can do it on YouTube, both channels. You can do it on BitChute, though the rewards or returns for doing so on um, a BitChute are uh, you know, swiftly and more completely every day being called into question. Uh, there's Odyssey that I very much recommend. Hopefully, you know, that is going to be something like a platform for the future until something better comes along. There's also Gab, there's Minds, there's Telegram, where I'm increasingly active. So please consider uh, following me over there. And I should, at this point, also thank the Praetorian Chads that make this all possible. Um, those for whom uh, all of the credit is due and none of the blame. Let me see if I can share this screen. I will try to keep the boomerisms to a minimum, especially with this uh, panel. But let's uh, let's open this up. These are the people um, uh, that I owe my thanks to who make all of this possible. So a uh, thank you one and all to my kind patrons. Let me get back over here. Oh, here's a new way. We'll do it like AA does with the letterbox windows. Um, so yeah, oh, uh, my books, shilling my books. These are my uh, books that are available on Amazon. This is a Vinculum. It's a uh, post-apocalyptic uh, sort of cyberpunk-ish adventure set in Istanbul uh, in the year 2076. It's about a book thief who's pursued by relentless corporate assassins as well as a, a strange religious sect and uh, has to go after a book that might be something more than a book. You can find that on Amazon under the name uh, Oliver Perrin. It's called Vinculum. And then there's my book of poems. Uh, you can find that on Amazon as well. It's called Cinders from the Bloomery of Youth. You'll find that under Oliver Timken Parents. So the shilling, ladies and gentlemen, is done. Um, before I get into the context contextualization of all of this, uh, I would like to uh, introduce the people uh, who are kind enough to join us this evening. Uh, thanks to all of them, uh, one and all. Perhaps we can move uh, clockwise uh, and start with Charlemagne. Uh, would you be able to uh, quickly just sort of introduce yourself and uh, maybe you know provide a very very quick context on you know your who you are as a programmer, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, yes, I'm Charlemagne. Uh, I make you know NRX videos on YouTube. Uh, I'm also a programmer. Um, let's see, my speciality is really on uh, back-end web APIs and some database programming and probably the type of program many people in the audience will be familiar with. I've also done a little bit of work on video games uh, as well, just as private side projects. Um, and uh, I have a pretty good breadth of experience at this point working in various languages and patterns over the years. Uh, so yeah, that's my quick general experience. Thank you, sir. Lambda. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Lambda, and by day I'm a programmer. By night, I run a channel called Lambda Bible Studies on YouTube. Um, my programmer professional experience is quite wide ranging, um, quite similar to Charlemagne, actually. I've done bits in video games, I've done bits of making front end web apps, I've done back end cloudy kind of stuff, um, lots of simulation and uh, user interface design. So that's that's my scope. And Maven. So I'm um, Maven. I do some content online, um, helping organize an event in August at the moment in the UK. Day to day, I work in information security. I've done work on the technical side, working in secure operation centers and helping design them. These days, I'm more of a uh, bureaucrat slash manager. But with the experience of the uh, IT world more broadly, which is sort of uh, uh, the periphery of this programming world because there's the secret hardware and making the machines talk to each other and all the rest. Yep, absolutely. So I, I work in, not so much on the programming side, but um, on the more architectural side, high level. Very good. Uh, and thank you for being with us. Skeptical Wave, sir? Well, I'm a humble audiobook merchant on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, in a prior life, I was an experimental physicist. 
Uh, I don't have any formal education in programming, but through various strange happenings, I've ended up as being a kind of a high performance computing programmer and DevOps and a uh, whole thing on the kind of neuroscience and neuroimaging side of things. Fancy, nice, thank you. Uh, and Dave, sir. Hey, yeah, um, I don't really have much of a web presence, uh, but I've been a programmer for a long time. Uh, like, uh, sounds like most of this group, I've uh, re really done a huge number of things, mostly in very large data, um, visual analysis of satellite data, um, also analytics um, for things like websites. Primarily a C programmer, worked a good deal in languages themselves, um, and a good deal with uh, kind of like the internals of databases, um, less even talking in SQL, but like how they actually store data. Um, I guess that's about it. Nice. It sounds like uh, um, Dave, if you were to tell us more, he'd either have to kill us or they'd kill him. Uh, it could be satellite, something like that. <laughs> satellite imagery. Nice. Okay. Um, well, then, uh, gentlemen, I think what I'm going to uh, do here is try to lay out uh, context for this and uh, bear with me. It's going to take a moment just because of how. Um, you know, odd it is, um, how possibly odd it is. Uh, but then from there, once the context is established, I, I have more straightforward questions and we should be able to move um, to, you know, getting your input on various things and finding out, you know, what you have to add to it, whether or not you think I'm just batshit crazy, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, so the first thing to cover here is, well, here's something I should say beforehand. In my work, I deal with um, semiotics. I deal with uh, the meaning of things, uh, how meaning is uh, expressed and understood and communicated, uh, particularly over time. And my riff on it was always to go forward with the idea that there is nothing new under the sun. And I think that's a particularly important um, approach to take to something like programming because it is conceived by most people uh, as a thing that is a very recent vintage it's all about tech. It's all about the present. And I think most people would scratch their heads a bit if you were to turn around and say, no, this is something quite ancient, and at, least, at least in terms of power relationships and perhaps the social role uh, that programmers, I think, um, play. So uh, an example that I used to use with clients um, is the example of someone washing and waxing their car. So you've got a car and it uh, very often is designed to look like a sinuous leaping beast, especially if it's a sports car. So it'll have its own rounded hind quarters like bunched muscle. It'll be named a Mustang or an Impala. And indeed, we refer to it as, you know, we measure its strength as horsepower, right? How many horses you got under the hood, boy, right? And you want to hear it roar, right? They'll design the front ends to look like a beast of prey with a grill and the lights. Now, people taking care of their car will often um, wax it themselves. And they will do so by applying the wax after they've washed it carefully in little circular motions all across the surface of the car. And anyone who's ever dealt with the equestrian arts or horseback riding is familiar with the curry comb. And that curry comb is often circular. That curry comb often has a strap that goes across the back of the hand. And one curry combs the horse with precisely the same motions that keep its uh, coat shiny and healthy and protect it from illness and you know break loose bot flies that might have tried to lay eggs or whatever it is. And so that I think is a sort of introductory example of how I try to look at things across time. They're completely unconscious of this behavior and how it recapitulates the idea of their ride, which is, of course, what they call vehicles, right? Car being related to chariot, you know, all these uh, parallels that I've just laid out are present in many, many things we do in life. And most people um, fail to notice them. But it, it is my view that if you understand the core sort of archetypal thing that underpins how and why people do things and how it forms a continuum across time, um, it yields certain insights that um, can be applied and give you an advantage in understanding, you know, what behavior is under consideration, um, how to influence it, how to shape it, how to draw it forth, these kinds of things. So this is generally the approach I take here with this uh, this business of scribes. So you know, who, who cares about scribes? You know, it's a and, and why would someone say that uh, that programmers are scribes? Why would it matter? Well, I, you know, hopefully this idea of it stretching across time matters, you know, but to show that it's more than just a, 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 a masturbatory autistic question. Um, for me, 
pursuing this is interesting because I want to understand how this class of scribes, and I'll make the case for them being scribes in just a moment, but I want to understand how this class of scribes thinks. And um, I also want to understand very particularly um, how it is that they've, uh, uh, have, how they have been and how they will be um, exploited by those whom I, I think all of us see as our opponents. Um, so I'll go into that a bit here um, and, and hopefully fill that in. Um, many people don't know that once upon a time, priests um, who ran the temples were also the bankers. The temples were very often the place where the money was coined or minted, and they would um, place their stamps upon the currency. And so to a certain extent, the priests were always already clerks because they had uh, writing from very, very early on. And that writing in most of the cases where we can see it appeared in the context of accounting and administration. So if you take a look at our earliest writing now known to us, that's uh, you know variations of Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian writing systems, they're used for accounting and administration first before they're ever used to take down like stories or whatever. Um, and that goes back as far as 3400, 3300 BC. So that's more than 5,000 years. And the roots of it are in accounting and administration. Likewise, um, almost as old and uh, possibly um, being shaped um, sort of as based on the monogenesis and diffusion hypothesis, Egyptian writing uh, appears in the context of labeling objects, the earliest of it in tomb finds, you know, ivory tags, seals and labels um, that seem to have to do with, you know, indicating ownership and possibly keeping track of things. Again, apparently accounting and administration, that's 32 50 BC to somewhere like 2690 BC. Earliest Greek writing, uh, before they picked up their version from <clears throat> the uh, the Phoenician writing, the earliest was uh, Linear B, um, translated. Uh, oh my. <laughs> <lost the host. laughs> you do, yep. <laughs> do you think this is deliberate? This is a t this is the test. What do programmers do when left to their own devices? Yeah. <laughs> well then. So I think we all know where he was going with that. Anyone want to <laughs> carry on from exactly where he left off? Talking about the Egyptian scribes. Scribes <laughs> and <laughs> language. <B>. Yes. <laughs> yes. Language B. originally developed to to write down information to be a, a, a place to do accounting and numerics as well. There we are. I am so happy I am back. It seems that the, <laughs> the demons are already on my case. To hell with them. The bags, the gremlins, the monsters. It's all y'all's fault. Y'all who make this shit. It just never worked. You're responsible for the <laughs> Oh, oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Sorry. I don't One know. of us hacked you. <laughs> I don't. I don't, of course, mean that. Um, yeah, I apologize for that. <laughs> Information security there, Maven. Hmm. So what was that? I was on Linear B. Yeah, Linear B, accounting and administration. So that's sometime shortly before the um, the whole uh, uh, sea people's, uh, you know, uh, total catastrophe. We're not sure what it is around 1300 BC. But anyway, that's accounting and administration. <clears throat> Tablets. Now some of the Earliest Semitic, like the Proto-Canaanite and stuff, appears to be religious. Um, the earliest Chinese is also religious with the Shang oracle inscriptions. That's like 1200 BC. Um, but uh, at least with the Chinese, we know that in many cases, the priests in early examples of the writing, not quite as early as the Turtle Plastrons and Ox Scapulae, um, their writing was uh, first used for, <clears throat> in the case of these, you know, the Ox Scapulae and the rest the oracle inscriptions that was used for divination. Um, but uh, very quickly, um, Chinese writing, uh, early Chinese writing was used to create what are more or less contracts with uh, the ancestors or the gods. Um, and they were often buried in the ground to be maintained. So the idea was still there's something contractual there. And in, 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 in any case, it seems to be uh, all these forms of writing are uh, associated with an elite uh, scribal class. And it's important to understand that um, <clears throat> Clerks, and let's not forget that clerks, um, accounting, administration, um, that word goes back to clerics, right? And we've got the idea of priests who are in charge not only of uh, accounting and administration, but also um, the sort of overlapping thing in the Venn diagram, which is law. So you've got the idea of Jewish law, right? 
and you've got the idea of the learned rabbi who's familiar with the texts, who can even convert the letters to having gematry of values of letters. They understand the esoteric aspects of the text, you know, like they say in Dark Crystal, writing words that stay. You know, you've got these, uh, you've got these um, players who are always already um, custodians of centralization, and it covers not just accounting, but also law. So like canon law, so you'd, you'd, you'd be educated in Latin in the Christian world, and you would then be learned in canon law. You could be called uh, a doctor or a learned one. You know, you'd get your degree. Um, so law and accounting are both uh, very much um, aspects of this. And if indeed we take a look at uh, etymology, I think this is worthwhile. We can, um, sorry, just have this open on an iPad so it would happen quickly. Take a look at code. The etymology of code, systematic compilation of laws from Old French code, system of laws, law book, from Latin codex, system, systematic classification of statutory law. Now that goes back to codex book, <clears throat> but literally tree trunk. And for those who are interested in such things with my own thinking, um, I believe human marking systems, meaning writing as well, all go back to how animals mark their environment. Uh, and very often they did that with uh, scent marks as well as visible marks, surprise, surprise, on trees. Um, you've also got the idea of book, which, you know, is related to birch and, you know, using um, plant material as a writing surface. But let's uh, take a look at the uh, etymology of program. Program from public, public notice, from late Latin programma, proclamation edict, from Greek programma, a written public notice, um, from stem prographein, to write publicly, right? Pro, forth, and graphein, to write. So, We've got the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, of uh, and grama, of course, meaning line or like gram. Um, we've got the idea of people who write. Um, we've also got, <clears throat> sorry, I've got to go forward on this. Develop. How odd. They're also called developers. What does develop come from? It comes from um, unfold and unroll, a sense now obsolete from French développer. Developer. Um, so it's the idea of unrolling a scroll or a banner. And so the story develops as the scroll, so to speak, is unrolled and revealed. Um, but in all these cases, the etymology sort of shows us whether we remain conscious of it or not, this uh, trajectory or heritage for um, programmers. So let me just get this last part in, which is this idea of, uh, again, coming back to why they matter. Um, as I said, clerks are al always already custodians of centralization. And you have the idea of a bureaucracy. Of course, bureaucracy comes from, uh, <clears throat> from this idea of a bureau, right? I even have a little line in one of my poems here, which I will share because it sums up um, one of the aspects of this. But the might of jealous scribes thrives disavowed and unseen, laying eggs in moist darkness swarming behind cabinets, boards and bureaus, bar and bench, and mortal fear of the light, quick to sting with venomous pen. Nobody's responsible. Just ask the cyclops begging for a sharp stick in the eye. The bookkeeper is nameless. He who applies for justice is somehow lost in the post. Out of the many comes the none. So we have this sense of an unaccountable elite class that has uh, legal and administrative functions. It's tied to a priestly class, and it's already, uh, always already, to again, swipe that Derridian expression, um, a, the, the, they are always already the custodians of centralization. <clears throat> so the last part, again, why does this matter? Well, if you take a look at Akhenaten in ancient Egypt, He's this guy who comes along and says, we need monotheism or something that's like monotheism. The scholars argue about it, but the gist of it is that he was replacing um, the uh, existing power structure of gods and the priesthoods that attended um, them with something that either was truly monotheistic or was uh, very much a significant step towards it. And what happened? The scribal class said, fuck you, you will. And so within a short period, they said, you threaten our power. We are the jealous scribes. We are the administrators. We are the ones who control um, the wealth and um, the administration. So, um, so not just no, but hell no. And he was uh, toppled from power. And he, uh, his, the faces were struck from his statues, which were destroyed or buried and all the rest. And um, 
you know, how long did it last? I think it was in the 1900s at some point, maybe the late 1800s, I think probably early 1900s, he was discovered again by archeologists. So the scribes were so pissed off about this new innovation that he wanted to bring in, that he was stricken from our memories. And that lasted, I don't know, 3000 years or more. No one could even remember him. So I like that personally um, from the reactionary perspective because there's a reactionary response that um, you could say was highly successful in terms of um, stopping this innovation. Now, what's also interesting um, is that uh, particularly if you take Freud's take with Moses and monotheism, um, uh, Moses came out of Egypt and brought these monotheistic ideas to the uh, Jews. And, um, and those Jews, of course, subsequently focused uh, on an elite uh, scribal class of priests who were uh, highly concerned with, um, with texts and uh, their stewardship. Um, and, and of course, power uh, devolved directly from um, that exclusive um, relationship with the text. But we can take it into the present, take a look at revolutions where you've got these wild-eyed uh, revolutionaries who come in. Sorry, let me just add Maven again. He seemed, he seemed like he dropped out. <clears throat> um, it, uh, we've got situations like the French Revolution, where the, uh, the, the, the head of the animal is cut off, and you have all these revolutionaries come in, and if they're not renegades, and sometimes they are, so that's the idea of disaffected elites. That's another thing that's very interesting to consider here in terms of the potential inherent in this scribal class of programmers. Um, if they're not uh, renegades, you know, who are themselves scribes, which is often the case, and they often play a role in any kind of, uh, of um, seizure of power, um, then what you have is fresh, young, new revolutionaries who have seized the reins of power, which is the centralization and control and authority, but they don't know how to run the damn animal. And so who survives? It's the one just below where the head was cut off. It's those verminous scribes who, who, whose, whose names are never known, who wield the same kind of unaccountable power that say an executive assistant for a, for a CEO wields. You know, if you want to get to him, you better get on good terms with the secretary, so to speak, or you will you will soon find out that your your letter will always be lost in the post. Whereas if she happens to uh, in this case, let's imagine it's female. If she happens to like the cute little way you get on and get off, you're going to find yourself on his calendar because his girl Friday is going to tell him he needs to do it. It's this kind of power that's beneath the surface. How many of us actually know the various people who are, you know, running with executive services or whatever it's called for, um, you know, the, the, the deep state staffing service? You know, we don't. These people move behind the scenes, but they wield enormous power and they're unaccountable for it. Think about the Bolsheviks. You know, Lenin gets popped onto a train by German intelligence and he rolls over to, um, to the, the, uh, Rus the Russian Empire. And within a short period, he's suddenly in charge of this vast machinery and he has no damn idea how it runs. So who are the cockroaches who live through, forgive me for the use of this metaphor, who live through every nuclear explosion somehow? They are the bureaucrats, the, the ones who've wormed their way up into the nooks and crannies and somehow can't be removed, who continue to exert um, their, their power. So we see that revolutionaries will always have need of the scribal class. And whether you're a revolutionary or not, it's very difficult to remove them. So let me come around to the last piece of this, which is how the left has dealt with subversion in the past. If you call it a cathedral, well, you've got the idea of academia and journalists. These are certainly scribal classes. One is like the uh, priesthood. The other one is like the town crier. And in this case, the town criers are all taught by the priesthood. And they're, they have the normative ideas for their flattened secular religion imposed on them through the training they undergo in our educational institutions. Um, now, I, I find it interesting, perhaps I'm wrong in the details about some of this, but I noticed that the left seemed to be very late to the game and uh, was caught on their back foot when it came to gaming. So they did not recognize fully the value of the gaming world. And so what happened was it began to grow with its own shape, its own forms, its own expectations and standards of behavior for a considerable period of time before they came in and decided that everybody had to have, you know, bouncing black dildos and rainbow flags and, you know, uh, uh, pronouns for your characters. 
right? So there was a considerable period of time where that got to grow. And that meant that when they came with hammer and tongs to um, bring them into line and you know, force them to join the party, there was a major pushback, you know, known as Gamergate. Now, I'm no expert on this, but I think I have the gist of it. Um, likewise, I think there may be an opportunity with programmers, which is part of why I want to have this discussion. Um, I have heard um, that while it would not be safe to say that most programmers know about Moldbug, it would be at least arguable that out of those who do know about Moldbug, Moldbug um, programmers are overrepresented. And so we have, I think, in the form of programmers, something of an elite scribal class that is not, I think, I would argue, from the outside, as an outsider, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, I would argue that this is a group of people who are not fully conscious of the power in their possession and who have not been made self-aware in terms of their potential role in, um, in ensuring that the them do not take control of everything. And that is either in the sense that they play a scribal role um, or in the sense, well, how should I say this? That came out wrong. Much like Gamergate, I think the left is late to this game. And I think that there are certain things about programmers and programming um, that predispose the people who are involved in it to be a little more intelligent. Now, I may be wrong about it, but they have to be you know, a bit above average to pursue what they do, which means at least in theory, um, they're gonna be more receptive to common sense, at least in theory. Also, because um, I, I believe, and this is where you guys are going to have to tell me, I believe that like, you know, computer science departments and the rest are not like fully paused like the humanities. And so they have not fully been um, worked over in the same way um, that other areas of academia have. Um, and so you can either go after them as something that the left hasn't fully recognized as being a valuable square on the board to capture. <clears throat> and in cases where they have already been captured, they're a potential disaffected elite who can be brought round to our side. And the left always targets the scribes. There's something about centralized planners and worshipers of text that demands that they always aim for the scribes. That is their way of doing it. You can go back to something like uh, Gramsci, right? Um, and the idea that you have to capture these institutions. And it's certainly by the time you get to Marcuse, you've got the idea that, you know, we must target the, the institutions and the ones where we can really shape it is to take care of the edu ed, uh, educational ones and the, um, the, the special classes of those who play this scribal role. So um, uh, hopefully I have set forth um, the gist of my interest in this. Um, and hopefully Lambda will come back in here in a second. I am going to, uh, there he is. I'm going to uh, take a look here and make sure that there's nothing I failed to cover. Oh, the last, well, we'll get to that on this section actually. So I think, yes, I believe I have covered the gist of this. So the first thing um, I would like to do is move around the panel and, and ask you guys, if I may, for a uh, 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 quick impressions on this. And then maybe if you could tell me what your thoughts are on what code is and and what a programmer is. Um, it, it, if any of that tends to fit with what I've already mentioned, then sure, underscore it. Um, it we do have five of you and I've taken up um, an unacceptable amount of time already. Um, so try to keep it concise. Um, but if, if there's anything where you think I'm off, <clears throat> or you would want to, um, you know, uh, uh, redirect me, you know, re-zero the scales, <clears throat> reorient this, um, please feel free to do so. And rather than go clockwise, I'll just ask the first person who has, uh, who has an uh, answer handy um, to sort of raise your hand, and that'll give other people who might want to take a moment to think about it some time to do so. Does anybody have uh, something they want to fire off with immediately? Line I can... I can go. So, uh, yeah, I agree with a, a lot of what you said. It's very interesting. Um, one observation that's been made frequently is how many people in our circles are programmers. I, I think that tallies with what you were saying about the audience for Moldbug and Moldbug himself being a programmer. Um, I, I would say there's probably 
a personality type, a, a certain type of person who w gravitates towards programming. They tend to be interested in systems more so than people, and they tend to be. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying this applies to me necessarily, but they're, they're slightly methodical, slightly. Uh, they have to have that spark of creativity, but fundamentally they have to be okay with sitting in front of a machine and nursing it through a bunch of bugs for for a long period of time. Um, but yes, this is a this is an elite group in the sense that most people don't understand what code is, how it works. It's kind of the fabric of our modern society. And there's a reason I think that Moldbug came up with that concept that you know like in the matrix you take the red pill or you see through the code to what reality is if you are a programmer you really can understand the true nature of how things work in society it kind of releases you from this magical grip of, of the technology in the same way that being a scribe would have done in the past you're a sort of methodical person but you understand the the real accounting going on. You you get how how society is really being held together, and that gives you this potential superpower of if you really understand something, you're harder to fool, and you have more potential power because most scribes, because again, as a personality trait. Sorry, I'm 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 conscious. I've got lots of ideas bouncing around my brain, and I've got to keep this short. But yeah, if you're a if you're the type of person to become a programmer, you probably won't be that political. I think I think that's probably a, a statement worth making. I think scribes have historically been the same way. They tend to like to keep their head down and live in a world of numbers or a world of code. Um, but those scribes who do choose to get involved have got enormous power. And what, what do we see about scribes? Um, who, who really writes history? Well, the person who wrote the original words might be a historian, but the people who propagate the histories that get received by the next generation are the scribes. They're the ones replicating it. And what do we see today? Who's writing history? It's a few key scribes in Silicon Valley who are choosing which bits of fact or fiction get recorded and, and and which bits get crossed out so what what letters get lost in the post right yeah, it's exactly which, it's, it's which which uh because historians have to be able to rely on sources and the scribes are the ones who would actually go about writing down those sources and cataloging them or not uh, whether or not they get to construct a story uh, or, or indeed making available the data that would be necessary to make any kind of determination about what actually happened. Of course, who gets to get, who gets access to various data, you know, for the, the current uh, virus of unknown origin uh, and whether or not that it can reveal anything, like who has that data and who doesn't. This, um, this control of data and information from the scribal class was most clear, I think, in um, the history of Chinese civilization, where the entire empire was controlled by the Confucian scribes. And um, when it went from one dynasty to the next, they would often simply delete information and um, books from the previous dynasty that counteracted who describes the scribes in power and what their thoughts were of the day. I think that is quite important also to our sphere because uh, Molbug's first name, of course, is Mencius. Mencius is the second most important Chinese philosopher to Confucius, and he existed in the Warring States period. Um, so not only is Molbug a programmer, but he's also named after a scribe. Uh, I would point out to, in your example, particularly in regards to Akhenaten and the scribal class, um, that programmers as a scribal class have never really been in a position of uh, real power in the current regime. There's a sort of brief flare up around the time uh, that you mentioned and other times in history. And this is time how you get like Silicon Valley, right? But all of these systems have become... Uh, fully managed within the uh, managerial ruling class. And even when you're a new programmer now, if you're just coming out of either self-teaching or university, any any vector you you take into a career leads you directly into a managed system. And most programmers, I would say 98% of them, uh, are actually entirely managed and controlled and really have no power to you know, actually challenge the system in any way, especially as an individual, because everything you're doing is essentially instructions handed to you by some manager or set of managers. And there's very little 
that you could actually do yourself um, and certainly very little you could do in any secret fashion, right? So there's not really a way for any particular programmer to subvert or undermine because the decisions are completely, everything you're doing is completely transparent and almost none of the decisions you're making except for details that only matter from an engineering perspective, none of those decisions are actually being made by you. Um, and, you know, again, pe people in Silicon Valley like Zuckerberg, et cetera, all these massive tech corporations have now just become tools of management. And although maybe they once were ruled by um, the programmer class, they certainly aren't anymore. So um, back to the example, we're, we're not in the position of Akhenaten, um, or we, we are in the position of Akhenaten rather, and not the scribes, because um, the scribes would just bury any of us. The managerial scribes would the bureaucrats would bury us uh, if we tried any such reorientation. So, so there's one exception to that, uh, which uh, Samigog already brought up, which is Gamergate, which uh, I think spawned the kind of the indie gaming scene, uh, which is a combination of artists and programmers who work outside of that managerial class, that managerial system of uh, the, uh, the development studios, the major development studios and produce their own art and their own programming and their own code, uh, which is not subject to the same whims and rules, at least so far, as uh, what Gamergate ended up imposing upon uh, the gaming development community in its wake. One of the remarkable things about programming is how an individual who's talented and disciplined can produce something that is genuinely equivalent or better than a, a vast number of programmers working inefficiently. So there, there are there are companies of hundreds of programmers slaving away, making almost zero actual progress on on features on on the products they're working on. Whereas you can get individuals who can go and you know spend a couple of months really working hard on something and produce a genuine competitor product. Um, Yep, and that's that why is... these big tech companies uh, spend so much time acquiring small development studios. So you get a few people go off on their own, come up with some good tech, a new way of doing things, and then that's where. And then they, their intent is not to monetize it themselves; it's to be sold to one of these big giants. Right, or to just shut it down before it can. You know, it, it, basically, you can buy it and just put it on a back burner if you think it's going to be competition, like the automotive companies used to do with electric cars in the seventies or whatever. Um, uh, but I do want to give uh, Dave a chance to answer. Yeah. Um, what do you uh, What do you think we got here? Yeah, I, th I think that generally people are correct, but I do think this is kind of like an amalgamation of things that really form from one source. Um, to kind of hit what you asked at the beginning, uh, Simeagog, which is what a programmer is, and ideally, I would say they're an engineer. And I mean literally just an engineer, a person that eff effectively goes from requirements to a specification to an implementation of something. And that it is, unfortunately, to be a little bit blackpilled about it and lean into what Charlemagne was saying, is that I do think it's actually pretty paused already and pretty much too late. Um, and a lot of that actually also leans into what Lambda was just saying, which was essentially some of the people listening, I'm sure the people in the group have probably read Fred Brooks, The Mythical Man Month, which essentially really does highlight that one good engineer, or really a small group of them, is considerably better than large groups. And he, he essentially posited that um, you know a group of seven is most of the time ideal, even for very huge things, and a group of 10 is when you start falling off. Um, and the way that that, the, the reason I want to bring that up is that the way uh, that that I think the programming field is kind of already lost is that the engineering component has fallen. And this, I think, is what Charlemagne was getting at, um, that the engineering component has really fallen down and that most people are just doing tasks. And when they are doing engineering, it's very narrow in scope. It's bound, it's thetaed, it's bounded um, very heavily. And there's not a huge amount of deciding what really goes on and that it almost doesn't matter what the specific attribute assessment is. And that's often what the best thing of programming is. Like to give an example that I hope I'm not too terribly technical on is like uh, a graph, which is a very common structure in programming is stored in two primary different ways. One way is a sparse matrix. Um, and another way is effectively a, a, linked li a set of linked lists. It's similar to a hash table. And neither one of those is right. They're right in different contexts and different circumstances. A, a sparse matrix is good when you have a full mesh graph. That means all the nodes are connected. A lot of the connections are there. And um, the association list, association of linked lists is best when you have very few connections, but a lot of nodes. And those kind of decisions on whether or not you would pick that structure or another structure are very rarely 
even addressed in modern programming. And those kind of decisions, it belonged to almost everything. And it was all washed away by the power of the computer itself. The machine itself allows these absurdly complex systems to just run. And people are building true operating software and languages that are not efficient um, in systems that are not efficient, but that allow people that don't really know what they're doing to get by and do it. So that most programmers are becoming something a lot more akin to an assembly line worker. It's not the same thing. And that's, that's too much of a stretch, but in that direction. Um, and I think that's a lot of what's happening. And, and I think that's why we are kind of, I will definitely agree with Charlene on this. That, that's why we are the, we're the Akhenaten. We're the Akhenaten. I can never say the word correctly. Um, and the only way out of that is to, and I'm almost done, sorry. The only way out of that is to kind of reference some things that you were talking about with Latin. I don't know if some of you guys probably listened to the Apostolic Majesty and um, Columba chat on Thomas More, which was very good um, for the record. And if you think about that, Thomas More was isolated from the the plebs, essentially, by his, by his knowledge. Um, by knowing Latin in the past, you had an elite caste that the normal people kind of couldn't enter. And because of that, new knowledge was um, protected and focused on either success or at least what a small number of elites wanted. Maybe not, maybe not the best for everybody. And uh, I think that's really the only way out for programming um, is to uh, is to really almost avoid. Maybe this is a little mold buggy in, but to kind of to parallelize and to avoid the current power structures of technology. And maybe this is what Skeptical Ways, I think you were getting at with the um, independent games. Maybe those Maven, sorry. Uh, absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah, is to, is to go parallel, and to but to ensure that that parallel group is very um, skilled. So I want, that's, that, that's yeah. excellent, because there's a, there's a key thing about this parallelism that I think uh, is already uh, under attack. Uh, because, uh, Gen computers, when we were generally growing up, uh, were something that often didn't do anything without you programming them. If the original, you know, uh, depending on your age, you may have have a you may have played with a computer where you actually had to manually program it with machine code, which is switching switches and loading, or you know something like the Apple II, where you have BASIC or or some other implementation where you're writing assembly code. Uh, I had an education, a small education in assembly code, the, the depth of the computing, but the the system is now being set up uh, in such a way where uh, uh, general purpose computing doesn't exist anymore. They're apps. You have your phone. You don't own your phone. You don't own the software on your phone. You don't own the, You can't run any software that you want on your new M1 Apple uh, product because it has locked down bootloaders and signed code. Uh, and that's all actually coming from the, this managed scribal class, which is locking down the machine, being preventing you from doing the things that you might want to do. So that means the next group that is coming through on an education on programming uh, will end up only experiencing this style of managed programming where there isn't a concept of developing something from scratch. You can't write your own code at the core level of assembly on uh, on an x86 processor, for example, because the x86 processor will no longer run your unsigned code. Uh, and so now you're locked within the uh, the the cathedral's educational system, or you know there's this this parallel code camp thing where they're just teaching people to do those kind of tasks that I think Dave was talking about, uh, as opposed to engineering, where you're getting an edu engineering education in programming. Yeah, it seems like they don't want you to have a full view, and it's it's interesting that you you talked about the thing because of groups of people with limited and partial views cannot operate independently, and they can be most easily managed and or exploited by those one level up who are capable of seeing the full playing field and understanding how and why they've assigned the various tasks. You know, so it's almost its own form of compartmentalization. Uh, it puts me in mind of an argument that happened during that whole program of enlightenment uh, architecture and building. It's covered very nicely in a book I always recommend called Buildings and Power by Thomas Marcus. But he discusses how the buildings themselves um, 
were laid out in such a fashion that they mandated classes and interactions happening in a particular way. So there's your idea of structuralism quite literally associated with the buildings and the relationships that the, the layout of the rooms enforce all the way down to, you know, a, a lecturer in the central spot and the, the ranks of seating around him, the number of minds that can be taught at a single time and whether or not that's really efficient in getting the most out of, you know, the teacher student relationship. Um, but they went so far as also when they were thinking about um, training people, of course, they wanted, as I often say, the bells that would ring. So you move from class to class was an important lesson in and of itself because it taught the coming factory workers to be uh, aware of when they had to move to different locations on the factory or mill floor um, during parts of the production process with the ringing of a bell um, to be in the right place for the next phase of production. And yet that's quietly passed over another one um, in terms of that significance. We think, oh, well, that's just to get us to go from class to class. No, it's to train us as a group to already understand that that's how we're supposed to move and answer and be present on time rather than, you know, drinking gin um, in a ditch and somewhere, you know, outside of London. Um, that's, right. that's one, one, one side note on that, of course, is that this work from home that has resulted has kind of broken down a lot of this uh, structured time that previously existed that you were referring to. And yet we find ourselves increasingly constrained by the nature of the apps, by what is permitted on them, by the uh, affinity groups that form around a given interest, whether it be gaming or chatting or, you know, whatever it is. Um, the last piece I wanted to throw in there is they also wondered about whether or not these, you know, uh, factory workers to be, you know, during this enlightenment program, whether or not they should be taught to read and write or just to read. <laughs> because there were certain threats associated with teaching them to write as well. And I think that very much goes to the point that, um, that Dave was talking about. And so I think we're seeing a fragmentation, a compartmentalization of these various functions and a, a typical structuralist attempt. In this case, the architecture, odd how it's that word architecture, of the, uh, of the programs themselves, or, or the, let's say the software themselves, um, the software itself and how the parts of it interact and how it's increasingly compartmentalized and you're sort of blocked in by the structure of what already exists in such a fashion that your 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 range of options has been strictly limited. Um, does anybody have anything uh, you wanted to throw in on this theme? Uh, I wanted to throw in something to uh, illustrate something Dave and also Skeptical Waves was saying in regards to um, efficiency and the really deep mechanics of data structures and that sort of thing. You know, if you've ever wondered, like, why why do I keep buying new phones and they seem to just get shittier and shittier and keep breaking all the time? Why are they so slow? Well, it's because uh, the programmers aren't really even thinking about the concept of efficiency anymore because we're now just being thrown these resources that are so insanely powerful that people don't even consider uh, the idea of behaving efficient, efficiently in them. Uh, but of course, what ends up happening is you have, you know, like 200 inefficient apps on your phone or something, and then the whole thing just breaks, even though you should basically be able to have, you know, 10,000 apps on your phone at this point, no problem. Um, so this ties into what Skeptical Ways was saying about uh, parallelism, because the part of the way Gamergate worked, and I guess the indie game community since then, is they actually just developed uh, really solid products, which is one of the steps. And so if you want to compete with any particular segment of capture technology, you know, if you have the right set of elite programmers, you can actually simply develop um, programs that work, you know, ridiculously more efficiently than anything on the market currently. Say, you know, this could even be a phone, for example, that would be a good case. There's a lot of, um, you know, independent phones that are coming out and, but they always tend to be buggy and not really work any much better than any of the stuff on the market and people don't really want it. So the, the technological angle is actually only one angle to uh, approach trying to get power from, right? It, wor it really worked for Gamergate because uh, there was sort of this coalescing of, of skill and passion and people in various fields that could market these products and there's platforms to market them on like Steam. So if you make an indie game, you can actually sell it, but creating other types of technologies, especially ones that involve hardware, take a lot more than just programmers. Um, you know, any programmer knows very well that merely making um, something that's really cool and works really well, and it's, it might be just objectively better than some competing uh, device or, or program, that doesn't mean that you're actually going to be able to sell or market the thing effectively. Um, so we do have to be thinking in these ways as well. 
Yeah, the hardware itself is another one of these things that forms a, a structure, right? Yeah. So uh, actually, from my previous life of uh, experimental physics, I worked on the kind of semiconductor physics all the way down to making transistors and such. Uh, and uh, this is a wall we're rapidly approaching where we're not going to get the kind of performance gains we have been getting from Moore's law. Uh, mm. we're, we're, we're getting to the point where uh, quantum mechanics is going to fundamentally limit us. And there's going to be a big rearrangement in programming when that happens. Does that uh, mean that people are likely to have to come back and revisit the old ideal of the elegant simplicity? Because that's all I heard yes, my programmer body buddies talk about back in the day. They're like, that's a gross kludge. That's disgusting. The simplest solution is the most elegant. Pursue that. So would it would it be possible to imagine that they'd be forced to have to go back through and uh, do that again in order to squeeze the gains out? That We're going to have to start squeezing, squeezing gains via efficiency. Uh, which is something that just hasn't been happening for a really long time now. Just to give a, 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 an, an idea, because I think even most programmers aren't aren't quite cognizant how bad most code and is. Right? R remember, like Microsoft Windows ninety eight, and and think about the functionality it had in comparison to what we use today, the operating systems we use. I would argue al almost indistinguishable. We if you're if you're running you know, mo modern computer versus what, what we had back then. Absolutely. You can still today. use one. To, you can still it's, use it's it like, today. It's you funny you say that because I've actually considered um, getting a Windows 95 or 98 install as an alternative to the new system. Yeah. So, so, so you so get the good MS Paint? Like <laughs> day to day, most, most people using computers could accomplish everything they can write. Documents, they could surf the web back in 98. But l l think about the numbers j just, as a, just as one stat to kind of make us realize quite how bad things are. The The fastest processor released in 1998 had a clock speed of about 550 megahertz. So that's times 10, 550 times 10 to the three. The fastest processors at the moment that you can buy are hundreds of petaflops. So that's, that's hundreds times 10 to the 15. We have processors which are faster by the order of 10 to the 12. Just, I don't think you can wrap your head around how, how big the number is, 10 to the 12. That's how much faster the machines that we're working on are. And the and performance yet, remains the same. Most yeah, is, people, is, your, is your new iPhone 10 to the 12 times more satisfying than your iPhone 7? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure things used to actually load faster. They're, Almost totally everything, yeah, everything it's, about um, our experience has got worse, and yet we've we've got this unimaginably powerful technology under the hood. So, so the hardware guys have done a great job, and and software people have just squandered it. And the question so is for, why. From my point of view, this this immense uh, gross inefficiency from all the spaghetti code and whatever it is it introduces significant security risk, um, which is why everything is compartment compartmentalized, containerized, and locked down massively to try and limit the huge holes written by awful code. Um, I know people in the defense industry, for instance, who still use Windows 95, 98 in isolated environments because they know it, they know how it works. They know how you would get in and how you wouldn't get in. And they literally still write code for some uh, particularly important defense programs on those machines. Yeah, I've worked on AS400's old mainframes for that exact reason in financial software. Oh, these um, are machines that are like from the early 80s that people still use today. Just for the, the benefit of the audience um, on what we're talking about right now, so Skeptical Waves basically mentioned you know transistor, transistors and the, the limits of the hardware being reached. So just in the, the basic layman definition, the way computer chips work is they're just ridiculously tiny um, wires that transmit electricity around, and they're basically the size of atoms, like practically singular atoms at this point. Uh, we're getting there. And there's a lower limit to how small you can actually um, make these things because the, you know, the limit is basically one atom or some arrangement of those atoms. And you actually cannot have circuits smaller than that. So there's a sort of physical uh, limit that we're actually bumping into. That's, that's what it means when we talk about the size of the transistors. Because yeah. the way chips get more powerful is you just make the circuits smaller. You pack more circuits in the same area. Now you have more power. It's a bit more than it's um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle kicks in essentially, and you're mm. not sure which uh, transistor the electron is in if you go small enough, and that creates all sorts of problems. But just to, as for people who aren't programmers to understand the situation, right? 
if if you wrote a program in 1998 that took you years to load, like you double clicked on the icon and sat there for several years before it loaded up, it should now load instantly. So it, there's no excuse. Fundamentally, we should be never experiencing any delay for anything that's just running locally on your computer. So what, yeah, what most people are doing in terms of programming, it is so, f it's, it's ludicrously far away from efficient. Like to say it's inefficient, I just think it's it's such an understatement. We we can't yep. we can't emphasize it enough. It's whatever the opposite of efficient is, and in spades, it seems. It's like. It's like the biggest busy work project ever invented in history. The the, the majority of pr programming these days is like to it, it's difficult to wrap your head around what most people are doing. Like you, you have these giant companies full of programmers, but what like this is why when when you find programmers who step back and think a bit, they start to ask questions about how wider society works because it's just ludicrous. So that's an yeah. interesting question. Is there, uh, yeah. uh, is 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 that actually intentional to lock down a certain type of thinker? Hmm. Well, it certainly it certainly is because um, I think so. e even if they're not really consciously doing it on purpose, you know, the the ruling class that sees any other class of people that could threaten its power, as programmers have, will figure out how to box that class in such that it can't actually threaten it. Um, and there's probably a mixture of conscious decisions and and just natural uh, responses causing this to happen. Yeah, I think you certainly got a, a class of people uh, for whom you could imagine it, it would be desirable to constrain and further constrain and atomize and fragment um, this block, um, particularly to keep it from having any kind of consciousness of whatever power it might have. I mean, I, I, I hear what you guys are saying in terms of it you know, being strictly limited and uh, perhaps even illusory in many respects at this point, but I cannot help but um, stick with this sense that there is there is much more there in potential um, than has been realized. And of course, I'm on the outside, so you know. But um, I, I, to keep this on the scribe theme, to to keep it under the the larger umbrella, I want to ask you guys about something very specific because what we find is uh, there are a number of ways that I could I, I try and explicate this with the scribal class. There is the idea of those who understand the text better than others. You know, in, in many cases, it would be like the legal code. So you can think about um, think about how, uh, you know, people uh, arguing over the details of, um, you know, uh, Jewish law and the person who understands the law better, you know, can actually win in court by reference to the texts that the others don't understand or the significance or the chain of reception of a particular theme or, 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 or learned aspect. Um, think about the idea of uh, in folk tales where a genie comes out and says you have one wish and it's very important that you phrase that just right because deception is possible and not having a close understanding of the meaning um, limits one um, in terms of uh, what one can do. There's, there's the idea of uh, superior knowledge of the text, its significance, how to phrase it, and its meaning uh, yields power. But there's also very much the idea of uh, deception. You know, there's a joke a friend uh, of mine, Tim, always used to tell about the guy who's looking for different lawyers, uh, looking for the best lawyer he can get. And the first one comes in and he's like, well, what do you think of this legal question? And the guy's like, well, you know, Supreme Court precedent and blah, 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 means that it's such and such. The guy's like, no, thank you. Don't want you. Brings in the next super powered lawyer. You know, some of you will have heard this before, but whatever. To make the point for those who haven't heard it. Next superpower a lawyer comes in and the guy says, well, you know, what do you think of this particular legal issue and how would it impact me in terms of my stuff going forward? And, you know, what does it mean? And the guy says, well, based on English common law and the idea that this evolves over time, it's a blah, 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 blah. And the guy's like, no, thank you. Finally, the last lawyer comes in and he says, you know, what do you think of this? What does it mean? And um, the guy walks over to the window, shuts the blinds, um, checks the knob on the door, makes sure it's locked, comes around to the other side of the desk, leans in close to the guy's ear and says, what do you want it to mean? And so we have the idea that the, the significance of, of the tech is based on interpretation um, and there is considerable scope for deception. And so one of the fundamental things is that of the, of, of the scribal class in the past is the idea that your more perfect knowledge of the text 
allows you to turn it to your purposes, to exploit its ambiguity and engage in deception. Now, when I turn to th this is me sort of stress testing my, my metaphor, my parallel I'm trying to draw here. Um, when I turn to the idea of programmers, there's certainly deception in the sense of things like Tro Trojan horse, you know, that, that carries with it the idea of deception. You've got the idea of deception with something like a virus, right? Which mimics a certain thing in order to be allowed in, in terms of, uh, you know, the cell. Um, so there, there are a number of, um, of aspects of uh, deception. Um, and, and many of the, the, the shorthand terms for um, that kind of deception, they all sort of conjure the same imagery. Um, but what I'm wondering about, is there a way to write deception into the code? And this is kind of weird. This is a little abstract, but I think I've got the right crew to tell me whether or not there's anything like that involved. Um, in the way in which uh, you would write a contract to seem to do one thing, but it in fact does another thing. I think there's certainly quite a bit of that going on with like big data, which I always heard about, but never got to see. And only a few people that I ever worked with got to be like taken up atop the mountain to see what is actually available to those who really have access to it. Um, I think there are certainly ways in which um, there is uh, deception built in in terms of saying, well, this is just to give you a, a, a search. You've got the ability to search with Google. Well, really what it is, is uh, Google has the ability to vacuum up enormous amounts of information about you. So there is some of that, but I wanted to ask you guys, you know, in terms of the scribal class, the privileges they enjoy, and the idea of superior knowledge yields ambiguity, which can be exploited in order to gain advantages. Do you see any of that reflected in the role of programmers today? My gut instinct is a hard no. Um, I would say that this no is like as hard as like a uranium rod. Um, there's basically <laughs> no way for me to intentionally write, you know, deceptive code um, and actually get it through. I mean, there are deceiving things in software, right? Like you mentioned, how does Google work? And sort of customers, even programmer customers can be deceived simply because, you know, like any product, you might be, someone might claim it works, it does this, but it doesn't actually do that. But in terms of the actual writing, the actual scribal duties, um, there's really no way you can deceive because like Dave said earlier, this is really just an engineering problem. And the question is, does it do what it says it does or not? These are objective questions. We can test objectively whether or not some software does what it's supposed to do. It's not a matter of opinion like law is, right? Where the lawyer can interpret the code because it's a matter of human interpretation. The machines do a certain thing. There's really no way, say for some quantum event like neutrinos are coming and bombarding your atoms or something. Mm. It's never going to do something different. Um, so well, but there's a- there's you, can't, a you, can't, um, you can't make it do something different. You can obfuscate and you can hide things and you can do that a lot. Um, but yes- Yeah, but that's only that's... exposed at the level of the code. Once you run it, that's no longer the case. You see what it actually does. But there, uh, but there, there is a tradition in uh, in Islam, you know, in terms of how um, they're allowed to lie. So, so, so I, I need, I need to, I guess, I should elucidate here how how the process actually works. So the engineer has their code reviewed by other engineers, basically. Um, so if you are intentionally obfuscating something, um, that's going to be caught, right? Or even if you're doing it accidentally, that's going to be caught. Um, so there's kind of no way to really intentionally write something deceptive, even in an obfuscating way, you would have to have complete independence. So the only way engineers can deceive is if there's actually no one managing them. Basically, they're running their own company or, or affairs or, or something like that. Um, as yep, long as so they're, I've, um, I've, yeah. I've seen that within companies where the IT manager has um, gone in and done things which the company didn't particularly want. And it's um, I, I can't give too many details on, on here, unfortunately. But yeah, if you're in charge of the entire IT, and you've got full admin privileges, you can um, do things to your advantage as an individual within a company. But there's also, this is just, let me get this last little piece out. There are different types of deception. So in Islam, where they're worried about not lying, right? They've got taqiyya, permissible dissimulation, right? They've got uh, kitman, they've got tawriya. One of them, I can't remember if it's kitman or tawriya, but the idea is that you're allowed to give someone an answer that could be taken in two ways. One of them is true and one of them is not. And it's not up to you whether or not the unbeliever or whatever happens to take it in the true way or yeah, the false I, one. So, unfortunately, so me, unfortunately, transistors are yes or no. Um, right, that's at the level of the transistor. But what I'm trying to get at is that at the level of the code, is it possible to write something that does what it's supposed to do, 
but also does something else that people are less likely to notice. Yes, but it's observable. You know, like that's a sense, like imagine you, you wrote like let's say that Streamyards was also like broadcasting was trans you know transcoding our words to text and broadcasting them to somebody for who knows why. You could still see that from your computer actually. If if you, you know, know what to look I mean, for. If, if you know what to look for, you may not know exactly what's happening, but you'd know something else was happening. Um, and like well, really, the only areas where, oh, sorry, go ahead, Londa. I was going to say uh, I've been I've been wondering recently if it was the case that um, there there were serious backdoors in every Android phone um, that could like I, I'm not a security researcher, but but it seems to me quite plausible that there is. Um, behavior happening on all, all of our devices that we're unaware of. Like we, Certainly. we, you know, we, even if you're a developer and you submit a program to the Play Store, you can't actually tell that the binary being distributed to everybody is the same, you know, file that you think that everyone's running, <laughs> of, of even the one that you wrote. Um, that's that code signing again. That's that's true, but um, if they are doing secret things, which honestly they no doubt are doing, it's still some programmer who put that there uh, right. under instructions and didn't. You know, they're not they're not sending all your data to the NSA um, for fun. And if they were, someone would notice it, right? Um, so, but yes, we do know that all of the major tech companies have more or less agreed secretly to give da data to the NSA, right? Like, well, that's we, kind of the we, point. I think it's easier for the people that. Are pausing us than for what I think Simeagog is getting us us to get the deposed. reverse. <laughs> yeah. So this yeah. this kind of gets into I think um, Moldbug's original writing, and one of the advantages of um, I think your your Semiagog is kind of approaching the the problem of what programmers could do in terms of their power as a class. Can they ap act deceptively? But sort of the whole point of Moldbug's writing is to do the opposite. And this is kind of what Bitcoin is as well, is to just formalize everything and actually reveal everything for what it is and re actually remove the obfuscation and deception. And programmers are very, very good at hunting out obfuscation and deception. And that's why this sort of strategy is sort of contrary to our nature, because we want to get rid of all of that. And so I think sort of this, this sort of strategy is actually fundamentally at odds with our nature. Hmm. And the, and the battle is really between the technical solutions which programmers could easily make, but then the social pressure and the, the legal pressure for people not to use them. So, for example, Bitcoin could be made illegal, um, at, at which point it's going to discourage most people from taking part, even though it has amazing properties um, to, to get around the sorts of financial controls that, that we, we don't want the state to have. Uh, likewise, there's been attempts to make uh, social media platforms, the equivalents of Facebook, that, that operate peer-to-peer. -peer. None of them have taken off um, because uh, to have something that's, to have a system that's uncontrolled and unregulated is is not in the interests of, of the people who could make use of that power. So I have a I have a parallel uh, topic to kind of go in term uh, go, direction to go in terms of um, obfuscation and uh, whether or not code does what it says it does and that's machine learning uh, and so something that's been coming up now in various big data machine learning type topics where essentially you're you're taking software and trying to find patterns mostly undirected from the programmer partially undirected from the programmer depends on exactly what implementations and so on and what people are finding is inconvenient truths in data. Uh, and I suspect there's a lot of unpublished and unmentioned inconvenient truths in data that are also being found. And so there's this whole movement now that's popped up and you can look it up called machine learning fairness. Uh, and that is injecting exactly the kind of things that you might think that they're injecting on top of machine learning work because they're not happy with the existing results. Yeah, so I'm glad you started mentioning machine learning because this is a really good topic to get into. Um, I'm only a layman in this field, uh, but machine learning is pretty interesting because um, basically uh, it's it's a type of pattern recognition where patterns are being discovered um, that no human being could ever discover simply because the relationships are far too complicated. And um, a machine learning model will, will basically notice things on its own that you didn't actually tell it to notice. And in fact, the analysis is so complex that if you wanted to discern exactly how the machine learning model came to a particular conclusion, 
there's no way a human being could actually dissect uh, it and actually understand why it came to that conclusion. So this is actually interesting because the world is very much run by these machine learning algorithms at this point, especially when it comes to big tech and search, right? Like, so all, everything that's going on in Google, like when you search, if you search for a term in Google search engine, um, there's probably not a single Google, Google engineer who could actually explain to you in detail how your search results actually came about because some I'm just guessing here how you might do this, but presumably a company like Google would do something like this. There, there are machine learning models that are just deciding what the results should be. And the decisions are so complex, just that there's so many different individual decisions that happen, like millions of them that make up the entire decision. No human being could actually understand it. So humans are sort of developing rulers, digital rulers um, or overlords that we can no longer even comprehend. Would you say that's accurate, Skeptical Waves? That's that's pretty close. And actually, an important thing is they're not just actually uh, moving together. They're also conflicting and competing for the re for what the answer is going to be, uh, w which is an interesting concept because coming from where my new field is, uh, that's also probably our model of the brain, where we have lots of other lots of similar neural network models that are competing to bubble up to surface to consciousness what the what you should be paying attention to, what you should be acting on and so on. That's an excellent summary of what a lot of things is happening in the background, but I want to I want to just focus back on this fairness concept that's that's mm -hmm. popping up, that people are starting to get access, researchers and and you know the public and so on are starting to get access to data, uh, to make decisions, and, and discovering that uh, and people are discovering the decisions that are being offered are not the politically correct ones. The, the, in some ways, it's, it reminds me of the internet in that it's a incredibly powerful technology which took off because of what it could do but it was difficult to control and i think um we're, we're seeing recently that, that there's increasingly effective ways to control the internet i mean it's, it still feels like it's a little bit the wild west but a lot less yeah. than it used to um so, so machine they, learning so, is quite similar right it's it's a technology with enormous potential power that's that's going to uh, be used all over the place because it's really effective but it's not immediately obvious right now how people will control it because as soon as you try to control it you you lose the essential power that it's giving you so the two methods uh, that you use to control are the same as you use to control the internet is censorship and propaganda um, so in the internet you're trying to sense information and propagandize the users of the internet and with machine learning you're trying to censor the information that the machine can see and propagand propagandize, add bias into the machine learning algorithms to generate your expected outcomes. So it's, course, it's exactly uh, the same. Of course, the bias is noticeable, though, because either these are just human inputs that are being given to the model, um, and that actually can't be obfuscated, right? So that that would I, I would say that's a very ineffective tactic to actually um, dealing with this problem of based machine learning. Um, which is it's implicitly truthful, right? That's the whole point is, is you can't, the machine is going to notice things whether you want it to or not. Um, and if you want it to not notice those things, some human being will have to explicitly tell it not, don't notice this because I'm providing you this weight. But anyone who looks at it will see that going on, right? So it's it's going to be like Maven said, the, the propaganda and censorship to, to deal with this problem. But I want to I want to jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, two, two aspects. One of them is that um, you talk about the powerlessness, but each time you talk about the power powerlessness because there is another layer of programmers or developers on top or engineers if you will who then exercise that authority so that's a simple matter of hierarchy rather than the native abilities or uh, opportunities that come with this class um, right. and then the other thing is you talk about things and and uh, you know i'd be interested to hear that it has to do with decentralized versus centralized you know uh, how the hierarchy works out um, but then there is this idea, you, you, everybody's talking about, well, you know, you'd be caught with that. You'd be caught with that. Well, yeah, if it's open source and you let people see it, you know, but I mean, how often is that the case? Like, I, I swear, I'm just in, I was in marketing, advertising, strategy, branding, right? But the the holy grail was big data. And uh, I had a friend of mine who actually did a large project. Um, and uh, it was the first time anybody in my crew of peeps had ever had access to where you, you go and you pay like real money to Facebook in order to get them to like break out what they have. This isn't, you know, some front end stuff that everybody sees. This is, you know, you pay real money and you get assigned one of their engineers or bean counters who like, you know, checks the boxes for you and, and starts to really open up the, 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 the wonder box of their databases. 
And, um, and, and, and of course, this is still, we're, just, we're only talking about things that they'll allow third parties to buy, right? So that's, there's a whole nother level uh, that I, I don't think anyone ever sees. And he was just shocked. He was like, the degree that they can get granular on everything, you know, we hear about it in magazines, but he was like, man, I was just sitting there with my, my jaw open. Um, but, but I never got to see that. I mean, all I heard, you go open up Harvard Business Review and it's like the implications of big data for marketing, blah, blah, blah. And then you never see it. Only the biggest players would get access to it. And Facebook wouldn't even give to them when they're paying a premium um, that real data. So that's over on the database side, right? But, um, but you know, database code, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms or whatever the hell you want to call them. I'm probably butchering all of this. But the point is that there's only transparency there if they put it in a glass box. So, um, you know, it seems that deception is still quite possible. It's just that within the cast, if you're given access to it, it can be detected. But I mean, that's like saying you wouldn't be invisible if you didn't have that invisibility cloak on. I could just see you. <laughs> but, but you do have it on. So the, the reason I'm trying to push back at these things isn't to contest any of this with you guys. All, all of you um, obviously know much, much, I mean, light years ahead of me with all of this. Um, but I do want to sort of push back and pressure test it because I want to crack the habit of mind that comes with saying there is nothing we can do and there are not opportunities inherent here. And then, of course, I'm not saying anybody's strictly saying that either. But I want to open this thing up to say, look, if if programmers and developers and the rest are self-conscious as a group, it seems they are a bunch of them come into the chat, you know, and they're like, oh, hey, dude, what's up? man? we all speak the same language or languages. Um, you know what what is inherent there as as a group of possibilities? I don't think it's that the um, I think that what you're hearing is is more that it's not software and writing software alone. That's the problem. And that like you I think you even actually said it yourself. Uh, you said it, that it was higher. It's hierarchy. And that's correct. So like, we don't have at like, if we had the most giga Chad ever piece of software generative algorithm that would tell us the most based answers, it doesn't tell us those answers without the data. And you, you, you described it as well that you need to have access to that data. Um, and it's that which actually provides you with the ability to, the power is really in the information, you know, like if you have a sailboat, the power is in the wind, you know, like it's, uh, not in your ability to turn the sail, so to speak. Yeah, that's and a key so, component of machine learning is that it, you need to train it on something, you need to precisely. cast it against some data, and you need a shit ton of data. Yeah, maybe that's actually you described amount. super quickly. Is that like the way like a, a very common machine learning example is finding dots in a circle. That's often the first thing that you train. And like, because all it does is generate random algorithms that take the right types. So if you're looking for dots in a circle, it just takes coordinates and outputs coordinates. It actually takes coordinates and outputs booleans, true or false. And you hit, you hand it, you hand it a bunch of coordinates, and then you tell it if it's correct in whether or not those coordinates are inside the circle or not. And you do that to it until it's really correct, until it's correct like 90% of the time, maybe 98% of the time. And then after that, you can count on whatever it generated to be correct for new coordinates. That you so it's it's to. it's rather like the old parallax on SLR cameras, where you get them to line up, and and once they they line up, uh, it's going to be in focus from that point on. I guess that's a bad metaphor. It, Never mind. Yeah, it's not exactly like that, but it is similar. Um, that that uses actually the same kind of algorithm that's used to make like uh, drones stay level. Um, but 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 there is a but there is a similarity there. Better stop there. Or you're going to have to kill us. <laughs> One of the things I think I hear you saying, Semiagog, is what's the potential if we could get programmers as a class to start to think in the same way and start to develop beliefs about how we should be using this power that we have? If, if enough of the community of programmers around the world took an ethical stance to only write code in a certain way, we would be able to prevent the other sort of code from being written by by sheer um, for, force of will, right? Yes, and or uh, never be employed again and starve. Yeah, and and an interesting case study I think of this kind of collective ethic for programmers is um, the the question of free software, which was a a movement started by Richard Stallman, um, which was trying to push for the idea that people should be allowed to use their computers to do whatever they want versus you know you you go to a shop at the moment you buy your phone you can't just install whatever operating oh dear 
Well, that was uh, an <laughs> inopportune removal. Yep. I think William, the uh, William, Fence, William Fence is not happy with the description. I was about to say I can hear the black helicopters outside. Yeah, yeah. we're back. So, sorry, I was, was going to say, arguably, the free software movement has been co-opted and turned into the open source movement, which has very subtly different goals and ambitions. But... Destroying IP! Sorry, that's a side subject of ours. It's, a, it's somewhat a side subject, but it, I, I, the point is that the the majority of programmers have this vague feeling that open source is a good thing, and they will encourage their companies to pick off little bits of functionality and publish it to the to to the wider programming community whereas the free software movement is more focused on the users the end users and what they can do with their hardware and software right um, that's the uh, the angle i was coming at with the devices no longer being general purpose computers that people can do with what they want ex exactly so we should i think try to have a general campaign for programmers to understand the concept of, of general purpose computing and freedom as a key priority because open, the open source movement is largely around mm. how can your company make more money if you are sharing in this wonderful communist utopia. And I really, uh, I like this point a lot, Lambda. This is something I've never thought about is uh, the difference between open source and free. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have my uh, almonds activated here. So yeah, and I, the word I, the, free uh, is so difficult in English, isn't it? Because we've got the same word for liberty and yes. gratis, and this this is a perfect tool for subversion because people yes. hear freedom and then they immediately latch onto not paying any money. Well, it's also the case that um, open source software is basically it's democratic software, right? And Leftism always wins in democracy, and we see this happening in the open source movement now. If you go to any open source software this year or last year, you just see, you know, Black Lives Matter on every single freaking site. I mean, it's just everywhere, and this is because leftists control open source because it's democratic. So this is a key distinction as compared to free. This is something to mull over. There's a number of, uh, of philosophical writings that are in, in this area discussing the differences, and uh, that's actually my next set of articles to publish. So we'll, we'll get to see some of that uh, original foundational that's material. Well, then, um, what about this business of how you work in groups and the idea of um, centralized versus decentralized, you know, collective versus individual effort? I think, you know, we've touched on it a little bit, but I want to make, make sure I I ask about it at least once explicitly, you know, I think um, early in this, this stream, the point was brought up that, you know, you could get um, just a handful of programmers together, working together, and they could do, uh, you know, quite a bit better work um, in many cases than these huge armies that are put onto a task. Um, some of that has to do with just, you know, um, things start to break down. It's just like teaching students, you know, if you got as many as five, six, uh, you know, I think Dave was saying something about like seven minds you know, in a classroom, um, then it's much easier to, to take those students through a real learning process as opposed to a lecture hall with 60 or 100 students in it simply because those people can't a certain, well, I mean, I sh shouldn't have to tell this to programmers, but, you know, once you have a certain amount of elements, there's a certain amount of complexity added, which requires its own sort of infrastructure, so to speak, um, that can begin to bog things down in terms of efficiency. Um, you know, like bearing surfaces on an axle. Um, but uh, is there anything that you guys can see as food for further thought or opportunities in terms of uh, uh, activating the uh, latent disaffected elites of the, uh, of the contemporary scribal class in terms of collective versus individual effort? Um, or centralized versus decentralized, or anything else related to hierarchy or structure in terms of how they work. I was, uh, decentralization has been a, a big thing in the programming world for a long time, but it's never taken off as much as people hope because it's just so inefficient in comparison to a properly centralized structure. So we have um, some decentralized systems such as Bitcoin and uh, and whatnot, but you see what the energy usage of Bitcoin and how many uh, machines there are and around the world just mining the entire time and compare that to the computational resource of a bank and it's it's miles apart. So the problem with some of that is intentional though. Like the, some, for the yeah, proof, well, of, work, with, the proof of work component. Yeah, with Bitcoin it's intentional. With um with BitTorrent it's not intentional. It's still using vast amounts more um network bandwidth than just distributing from a single point or a few numbers of points. Um, then, and you have to 
you have the same thing when you try and uh, decentralize websites. So the problem really with that is you run into these boundaries of Moore's law and inefficient code far quicker perhaps than you would otherwise. And it's also more expensive uh, in real not, terms. This is not my uh, field at all, but over the past three years, I did quite a bit of work for some um, uh, main, major manufacturing companies related to technology. Um, and part of that involved um, envisioning what was going to be happening that they should be prepared for as a company in terms of their messaging and exploitation of it. So it was sort of branding. It was also sort of new product development sort of as two clusters. What You didn't get as far as saying you need these new products, but it was like, look in these areas for things that will apply. And so in the course of that research, I got to hear a lot about edge computing. And as I understand it, that's pushing things out to the device level um, and allowing uh, or encouraging uh, the, the processors out there on the periphery to perform some of the computational work. Am I understanding that correctly and, uh, you know, or misunderstanding it? And, you know, what does that tell us about centralized versus decentralized? You know, maybe it's not something that we have to go down the rabbit hole with, but it does suggest that there's maybe a little more to the story about centralized versus decentralized. In some ways, the question of edge computing is, why was my device not doing my computing already? <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's it's, the it's kind on of the, your cloud, right? Put it on it, your cloud. It's the kickback against all of this as a service stuff, everything being as a service, which in a way we've been living in the software equivalent of you will own nothing and be happy for quite a long time. Um, but there is an issue with the endless drive to centralize all of software into a single system, which is, as you mentioned, as you increase the number of functions that your program is attempting to do, you don't get a linear increase in complexity, you get an exponential increase in, in complexity. So this is one of the reasons why you end up with giant teams attempting to just maintain a seemingly simple program, because if you just are a little bit too ambitious, you end up realizing it's going to take more hours than the you know, re remaining time in the universe just to debug this program that you've tried to, you know, you just, you've just bitten off a little bit more than you can chew and suddenly the whole development process grinds to, to a complete halt. Uh, yeah, so the, the centralization versus decentralization thing, there's really just advantages and disadvantages to each one. And in the software industry, there tends to be, you know, sort of cycles between these sort of binary states where, you know, there'd be a trend towards decentralization and then we'll hit the limits of that, realize something should be centralized and there's trends towards centralization. And that's being overdone now in cloud computing where, you know, everything on the entire internet is in like Amazon's data center or whatever, right? Um, so you're probably gonna see a trend more away from that and, it's not really a question of which is better. Should programmers centralize or decentralize? If we're thinking in, in ways of how we can use our power, it's that there's advantages and disadvantages to each in various scenarios. Um, I think the, the concept of centralization, though, gets me thinking about this idea that uh, Moldbug puts forth. And I think this gets into his central diagnosis. He talks about you know monarchical power, oligarchical power. Um, programmers actually have monarchical power over their systems um, because we can control it in a precise way and force it to do anything we want, uh, right? And this is really the, the the way that Moldbug approaches the problem of US government is he sees the system and he thinks about, okay, if I could just have monarchical power over this thing and make it do exactly what I want, design it exactly what I want so that it deals with the human inputs in this uh, improved way, such that it actually outputs what it's supposed to. You know, the U.S. government doesn't actually provide popular sovereignty. It's a system that's not doing what it's supposed to do. If I had complete control over this system, you know, how would I fix it? I think this is a good thought exercise for any programmer who actually wants to solve like political problems. Is think about the problem from this the the way you think about your code. Is you know, if I wanted the government or some other system to perform the way it's intended, how would I actually structure it? Um, and this also involves this idea that, you know, he's put forward lately about admitting the actual state of thing. This gets this gets into formalization, formalism and informalism, right? So um, Moldbug wants things uh, formalized and this is kind of how you approach problems. So let's say there's a, there's a problem in the code, you need to, to debug the code and you actually don't just need to debug it, but you need to re-architect it and get it to a new state such that the program 
isn't a complete mess anymore and it's restructured to do what you want. Well, if you're going to do that, you have to admit that it's broken right now and you, you have to actually provide a migration path to your new structure, right? You can't just drop in your new structure and suddenly just switch over to it. You have to actually move towards it in some incremental way. And this is actually how Moldbug is approaching um, debugging and fixing the U.S. government right now. If you read his essays on FedCoin and the inflation economy, um, you know he writes about okay, we have to accept that the thing is broken in this way, but we can't just go, we can't just suddenly switch to some new paradigm. We actually have to provide a migration path to getting there that's actually sensible. So programmers should think about politics and how they can use this their power in this kind of way and not uh, sort of skip to the last step. This is probably a, a useful way for people to understand what agile means and why seven people can just do things that a hundred can't. Because if you're if you're throwing a hundred people, it, almost like in you know in in World War One where you just chuck lots of people into the meat grinder to try to make make progress. The only thing you can do is move iteratively. You can make these small evolutionary changes, but you always have to have a working system in in the middle. Whereas if you've got a small commando team, they can plot out a path across the landscape and say, we're going to have to go here, then here, then here, and let's execute like effectively. And, and it just gives you the ability to do things that are just impossible otherwise. Yeah, you cut around things like issues with communications or chain of command, how things get gummed up, you yeah. know, especially prior to like, you know, uh, ready use of radio and, uh, you know, a telegraph or telephone, you know, in World War One, the, the, the damn lines were always being blown up by the artillery. Um, and as I've been saying for a while, I think the state of software is the cathedral's biggest weakness. Ultimately, I don't think the current elite have the have an, any idea quite how bad things are. And if, if if they're relying on their software systems ultimately to keep to be their fortress and to keep them safe, they're going to find their walls come tumbling down pretty quickly if a if a really eff effective group decided to take it all down. Well, now, of course, we are not suggesting that anyone do anything illegal or even <laughs> incivil, right? We are absolutely yeah. here saying obey your local laws and regulations. Um, okay, Maven seems like he's back in. Hopefully that's working like it ought to. Um, so, so one quick note on the scale uh, that uh, I thought I haven't heard mentioned yet is the the concept between like the seven versus the hundred programmers is that often you can't cut the tasks down small enough for a hundred programmers to actually work on for a project. You have to understand a certain scale, a, a level of scope to actually be able to implement things sensibly in order to interact with everybody else. And if you have a hundred programmers, you need to have a hundred tasks. And those tasks are very different kinds of tasks than seven programmers tasks. Yeah, only one person can tie their shoes at a time, right? There, it's possible to slice that to slice that pie a little bit too thinly, uh, such that nobody is being effective in the work that they're doing. I think as we're probably going to jump to something else. Just I want to stick on that migration thing because I think it's actually really smart, and I did like that mole bug. But it's what's what's hard about that is that. Um, uh, and what's also would be hard for a small elite team versus a large group of World War One trench folks is is what the actual telos is is what the actual end point is is that you have to have a very clearly defined endpoint to know how to migrate um and and a hundred people or seven people without a clearly defined endpoint um is gone and i think that's actually what is the weakness um that lambda is talking about in the current uh structure is that instead of having a real answer it really is just a bunch of people kind of going and hoping that something good comes out and so where I think that maybe what you were trying to get at earlier, Simi Agog, that we could take the mindset of the programmer or collectives of programmers is to decide on something to really actually do. Um, but like how to figure that out is hard. I mean, the people that have tried to do that are things that are like, um, well, they're not used, you know, <laughs> like they are the social media platforms that aren't used. They are, um, and, that, and that is what's hard, you know, like if we wanted to have a very safe kind of hidden communication network where we wrapped where we made we're, we're talking on a video like this but we made it look like it was just like um web phrase web web page browsing or um streaming video or something like we're watching netflix that's that's actually technically possible but you have to somehow convince everyone to use that and convincing everyone to use that has to be done in the open and so like it, it's almost like you have to decide what you're going to do 
that takes talking to a bunch of people somehow keep that secret and then get people to do it. And I think that's why sometimes it sounds a little bleak, but at the same time, I do think that it is, um, that does also exemplify the weakness of the current regime's use of technology to kind of keep people down. Um, and conceivably there's just a fracture there, like a little chink in Smog's armor. I just don't know what it is. Y y y yes, indeed. I mean, you're, you're always struck with that issue, you know, um, w whenever you want to do something secret, you know, it necessarily mandates something like cell arrangements or the rest. And, and that in turn means that you're naturally limited to that cell. And as soon as you want to make it broad, it's permeable and it's accessible and, you know, the rest, which is why I tend to um, um, dismiss at the outset any ideas of secret squirrel stuff. Um, I, I think at this phase, um, anything that would be undertaken would have to be very much in the open. You know, it's not a bug; it's a feature. You know, I'm not trying to hide it. You know, let's uh, let's let's move straight towards this and um, and be open about it. Um, well, now I, I do want to um, move over into this subject of how programmers think. Um, simply because it yields certain things um, that are valuable. I mean, I think the argument could be made that a lot of what is interesting about uh, Moldbug and his approach to things is that he tackles uh, topics in many respects, at least in some respects anyway, uh, like a programmer trying to view it as an overall system. Um, you know, I, I often point out that it's structuralism um, in many respects, and that's not to dismiss, you know, it's just that it'll help people coming from the humanities who are familiar with like a Saussure or, uh, or um, Levi Strauss, you know, to understand perhaps some of the aspects of how programmers are approaching things, you know, so that, that's, that's why I bring up structuralism, but it has, has some, you know, looking at the system overall, the way things flow, you know, uh, points versus or nodes versus um, connections, this sort of thing. Um, I think there's value in understanding how this class of scribes thinks, um, while at the same time being careful to you know, not to be trying to assert here that they all think the same. Um, uh, and I think there's also the subject of how you as programmers have to think because of how the machines, so to speak, think. So, um, I know that you know our tech overlords, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, so to speak, so to speak, um, are, are they must have been shaped to some extent. At least many of them, many of the pioneering ones, must have had their approach to things shaped by the limitations of the hardware that they're using, and that in turn shapes the software and the rest and how to look at things as systems. I think. I'm not doing a very good job of, uh, of setting the stage here, but I think what I'm really um, after is these people. I'm sorry, to interrupt. I'm just going to have to take my leave. I have to take care of uh, some family issues. So uh, enjoy the rest of the stream. Bye, bye guys. The boys. Thank good you very much. See you, See you. Boy. Um, and so I, I think the people who are doing what they do have had their thinking shaped in certain ways, and it's not how members of the public necessarily have had their thoughts shaped. And so in addition to just wanting to know, hey, how do programmers think? What's useful about it? What's interesting? How do you think it differs from quote unquote normies? I also think there's a dimension of it, which is that technocratic overlords will to a certain extent have embraced this type of thinking as well. And so it's useful for people who are not exposed to programmers and programming to hear something about how problems are approached, envisioned, tackled, how solutions are pursued, um, just in terms of knowing what the uh, tech overlords are doing and um, how they may um, uh, pick up some of that thinking and try to throw it into their own toolbox. Is that anything anybody would care to jump into? Sure. So I think if you start programming, you're presented with essentially a blank piece of paper. And on that, you can do more or less anything you like. So you start making your program to uh, do word processing. And if you really want, you can add a little, you can make it run Doom in the background or something. So you can um, just press a few buttons and start playing your game. You can do that if you like. And so you're presented with this kind of endless world of opportunities and Spenglerian in terms is very Faustian. But then at the same time, if you want it to actually be adopted or you want it to work as something else, you end up having to constrain massively what your program can do, how people interact with it. So I, I think maybe a programmer is someone who thinks of endless opportunity for themselves uh, or for the individual, but they, when they come to dealing with other people, they think in very uh, much more smaller, more constrained terms. And so I think perhaps that's 
So you get that in the dating apps, for instance, where it's like, all right, in theory, you can date anyone. You can go on, you go on this site and, you know, do whatever you like. But in reality, um, you can only show a few pictures. You can only have a few lines of text and you can only talk to them in these very, very uh, constrained ways. So I think so, that's, uh, that's perhaps how I would describe it. So part of that is uh, it's interesting because you just added, and I should have thought about that. On the one hand, you have the constraints of the hardware itself, um, depending on what that is. Um, and then you have indeed the constraints of industry standards. So as I recall, I mean, even HTML is a standard, right? That just allows yeah. these these pieces to, to talk to each other. Yeah, it's, it's not just constraints of the standards. So say you want to, you weren't, one of the difficulties of working in these large teams is that everyone writes code in completely different ways. So if you're in a team of seven people, you can understand how each member of the seven person team writes their code. But then when you get to a 20 person team, you might look at a bit of code that someone else has written and have no idea on what it means because they're conforming to a different standard. Um, they've got a different way of thinking about how to solve this issue. So it's, it's more that it, when you want to deal with large groups of people, everyone must c constrain themselves essentially. And that's, uh, that's, I think, what programmers think. Uh, All right. Now, I am, I am going to be listening as the next person comes in, but I'm going to um, um, shut my camera down here for a second. I'm going to grab myself a cigarette, but I am listening. Hence, okay, hence I, the Bluetooth. Please go on. Great. I, I have two thoughts. So I think that there are two experiences which all programmers have in their life, which are actually almost unique there's there's very few other people who are faced with with these experiences in quite the stark way programmers are number one is you're faced with reality you can look at a problem for for hours or even days at a time absolutely convinced that you are right and then finally come to the conclusion that you've been proven beyond a doubt to have been wrong all along and that gives you just yeah. such humility in your thinking it means that you can really question well i don't think this necessarily has this effect on every programmer but it it's a it's a trigger that can make you think ah i can be wrong about it i can really hold a belief very strongly and have thought about it for many hours and be wrong and that's quite a striking experience the other thing is programmers actually have hands on experience with complex systems so there's quite a few disciplines which think about complex systems in one way or another say sociologists might might spend a lot of time positing theories about complex systems but nobody understands in their gut what it, what a complex system is like what does it feel like what is what, what's a complex system like you, you know fundamentally like I, I I can't I can't quite articulate it, but like the the process of spending time on something that is, that is true, like especially if you're working on something like a game or a simulation where there's a lot of cross cutting concerns where you can't mathematically lay things out when you, when pieces interact in surprising ways with one another. And again, it's a case of like I can't understand this thing simply. That there just fundamentally are interactions here that are complicated and i think those two experiences lend programmers certain patterns of thought that are very helpful for analyzing complex things like society yeah just consider if you had to build a human being uh from scratch right all of the complex interacting systems like you dr frankenstein but in a, in a serious way right think about how much better you would understand complex systems and the human body specifically if you actually had to build it from the ground up and there are very few professions where you actually are constructing systems that complex and that interrelated with side effects uh, between systems. Um, there are very few professions that actually do that, but we actually do that sort of thing every single day. And we have to actually hold that information in our heads, right? So if you yeah. go through this thought experience uh, experiment, and let's say you're, you're adding the liver or something, you're going to have to keep in your head the entire system that that thing is interacting with and that's how we approach any given task um so it is a huge advantage i would say another advantage and we, we touched on the idea of constraint is constraint itself is a huge advantage and i mean like physical constraint here because this is what actually forces you to think creatively and come up with really really excellent solutions the type that people don't really make anymore because they have unlimited resources in terms of computation power and this is how a lot of great technology was originally created. I mean, if you just look at, uh, find find any, you know, gaming channel that explains like how some 
Super Nintendo, Nintendo, or Amiga game or whatever was written, and you're just blown away at the skill level and ingeniousness of these people, and you feel like a total chump, um, realizing what you know how pathetic your skills are compared to these giants. Um, that's an advantage programmers have, reactionary programmers have, in that our resources are very constrained and we really need to optimize our efficiency, right? This is the whole problem with the American populist movement is it's sort of just thinking as if it had access to the same resources as, you know, the Republican party or something. And they're not actually thinking creatively, you know, I actually do have extremely limited resources. How do I efficiently use these resources to achieve something that should actually be impossible? Like there, there are many things done on, um, various of these old consoles, particularly when it comes to rendering like facsimiles of 3D graphics or something that should kind of theoretically be impossible, but people find ways to do it. And that's what you're trying to do politically right now um, is, you know, you're, you're in this impossible situation. How do I find some optimal solution that actually progresses me somewhere? Um, that's the way you need to be thinking. Yeah, something that's more than uh, merely incremental and you know, in the <clears throat> I come from the the much less constrained, much more qualitative space. Although I, I limit claiming that because it sounds like the, there's a huge component of what you do that is qualitative, um, that that steps aside from sheer numbers. Um, but yeah, we call it white space. You know, look for the white space. Look for the thing that got missed. Um, that is sort of the opportunity that comes out as sort of as a negative image, as as inherent in the potential of this thing. The constraint, that's, I think, um, also. Well, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, that looking for what's missed, and uh, that's what I do essentially um, in security, where it's like, wh what has been missed? How do you break the system? So that's either the either advantage of understanding how a system works uh, innately, like Charlemagne was talking about, is you can understand how to go in and break it. The constraint can also tell you whether or not you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, and that if you if you're tempted to leave the constraint, uh, simple examples in software would would be um, like Git is a directed graph. It it actually is annoying to use sometimes because of its nature, its internal nature, but it sticks to it. Um, databases, relational databases, are first order logics over a category of sets. That's all they are. That's the whole thing, and they don't break out of it. And so you know you don't. In a reactionary thought, and how this can apply is if you think about something like. De Maestra, <laughs> or you think about like, you know, just friend or enemy distinction, you boil it down to a pure thing, or you think like conquest rules that McIntyre is bringing up all the time. Um, are, are we stepping out of a deeply known, long time thought, truly reasoned idea, or are we not? Um, to what you were originally asking, Simi, I think we stepped away from a little bit, but isn't bad, which is just how do, how do we think about things? I think I think about things a little bit different than what was brought up, but not in contradiction to any of it, which is that most of my time, I'm trying to take whatever the problem is that we're solving and map it to one thing that's already known. Um, like, ha is this problem actually just traversal of a red black tree? Is this thing, what is it? You know, what is so it? So it's like of orienting against the horizon and navigation, right? So figure out what your constant is. Is that what you mean? It kind of, it's more like, well, what is this thing? You know, like is, is sorting books and sorting records the same thing? Kind of. Yeah, you know, so that's, like... that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the mathematician part of it. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. To ab abstract the fundamental shared feature. And yeah, as soon like as the, you, so as you if decide I know to drive a car, can I know how to drive a tank? Can I translate it essentially? Right. And what can't you translate? You know, like it's very different to turn a steering wheel than to drive two treads that need to have different moving. Um, yep. And so like, so I think that a lot of times the software programming mindset that can benefit the reactionary mindset is, is to stick to those older ideas and how we can stick to those older ideas, like uh, whether or not we're deviating from them. You know, if you took the Pareto uh, residue and um, uh, derivation, is that what the other term is? Like, I can't believe I'm spacing it right now. Yeah. Um, sweet. Yeah. And like, if we started treating residues as derivations, we know we're making a mistake, even if we think it's right, or even if it makes our current in the moment conclusion seem more correct. Um, and I think that software engineering can be very good at that. Um, at least the mindset of it to know like, oh, no, no, like, okay, yeah, I want to store this thing in the database, but it breaks the relational model. So like, it's now entity attribute value, and I'm fucking up. Um, and I think that that's maybe a mindset that the, kind of the software minds could apply to what we want to do politically. Um, I would hope, I guess. 
is and, and I think that's also what draws people that are software minded to this thing. Is it a truity to form or mm. an honesty to form? Maybe, maybe another thought that might be useful here that came to mind while you, were, while you were talking related to that. I think most programmers live in a lie in their day-to-day -day work. So we we deal with abstractions all the time. We're, we're given an API, which is a, an interface onto somebody else's world. And that API is full of all kinds of simplifications. And we just we just believe, you know, naively, you can't help it. You go into a new system and you with a new API and you just take their word for it. And that, in some ways, it reminds me a bit of what you were talking earlier about semiagog, the, the lies of language. We read a method and it gives us an, a kind of a, a, something we can grapple with. And we, we imagine the properties that this thing has, but that the abstractions always ultimately break because what you're actually doing is different from what you think you're doing um so map map territory stuff it's it's like a bad yeah it's like working with a bad map so you, you you the map gets you from a to b but the distances are wrong something like that so you or, or sometimes that that road that you've never thought to go down you've trusted every other road has worked out fine but then that one road that happens to be a minefield and then you die so <laughs> like you, you, you just and in a, in a way this is like we're, we're asking what's the difference between like wh why are there the vast majority of programmers who are kind of sleepwalking through their day-to-day -day life just doing the the tasks like Charlemagne was saying at the beginning of the stream they're just given a simple task to do they just do it and go home and don't care and that so it's it's very easy to be a programmer without taking that step back and thinking about the wider system because you're you're perfectly useful to the system if you don't ask the bigger questions and someone else will deal with the the full i mean ultimately the reason that the the way that a lot of this leaky abstraction stuff works itself out is like okay so that method technically works but it's horridly inefficient but fortunately over the last 4 years our computers have just doubled in speed so we, we we can kind of hide endless amounts of junk under the bed. Um, but uh, hope. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me of um, I think the 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 leaky abstraction thing. That must be why Moldbug writes about power leaks into uh, <laughs> maybe press, <laughs> right. Yeah, probably is. That's got to be it. And th thinking about this, um, you can you can kind of hide infinite government. Um, within the cathedral um, in the same way you can hide things in a leaky, leaky abstraction, right? So the abstraction we have is, is the US government is supposed to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. But if you wanna do, you know, Operation Omega, you just put that in the press and you can just put, you know, infinite yes. things in there, yeah. Well, exactly, think, like normal people, members of the populace in a democracy are dealing with an abstraction of power that they've been told works via elections and such. And it, it has enough correct properties that they sort of just ignore the possibility that there's anything else going on under the hood. All right, it's an explanation that fits the observable circumstances um, convincingly, yeah. but simply isn't true. Right. right. Yes. All right, hence, hence the issue with, um, yeah, being trapped in the, uh, in the uh, abstraction. Um, well, first off, I want to make sure, is there anything else that you guys wanted to add to that theme or point before I throw another um, uh, uh, idea towards you? Um, just on on this idea of, I think I think we're on the analysis point. Uh, I don't even remember what the original point was, but I wanted to point out here um, that, uh, you know, a lot of what we're doing um, is dealing with the flow of information. We made this point earlier about uh, data versus code. And all code really is, is it's flowing data from one place to another, um, and then ultimately performing some operation on it. And, and most of what the programmer does is actually um, dealing with how to actually get information from point A to point B in a form that makes any sense. This was kind of what an API does, right? You're, you're trying to get access to someone else's data, and you need to figure out how do I get that information out of their opaque system into mine, and then do some operation on it. And I think this is how Moldbug actually uh, analyzes the US government, whereas instead of flow of information, it's flow of power. 
um, Moldbug is looking at how is power flowing through this system. And what programmers are really doing for most of their day work is just analyzing how information is flowing through the system and figuring out, okay, how do I capture that information and, and do with it what I want? Boldbug is saying, okay, how do, how do you capture this power and make it do what you want? Um, so you, you're just sort of throw up, you just threw his skirt up over his head and revealed his magic secret, which is <laughs> sort of transposing a, a particular approach of thinking and substituting um, power for information. Um, and and it, there's certainly a, a, a heritage for seeing uh, that inherent relationship because we say that uh, knowledge is power. But my uh, friend Tim often likes to say, no, 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 no. Um, power is knowledge applied. Um, and that kind of carries us over to um, this, this, this other angle that I want to throw at you guys. Um, we're coming up on two hours. Maybe we can go a little bit over if everybody still has uh, some time, because I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this in particular. Um, I have been um, working on a strategy series um, on how to tackle some, you know, issues, uh, you know, that confront us as the, the dissident right. Or, or however it may be designated, neo-reactionary or whatever, what, whatever particular facet or flavor uh, you enjoy. Um, and I, I was originally gonna make this stream a part of that series, but I decided in the end to break it off because I think it stands on its own in certain respects, but it certainly does apply to the idea of how to get some things done. And 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 here's, I, I guess, how I'd try to set the stage for um, for for this question. You know, you have the idea of the the, the things that come with the office, right? Like one of the ways that I like to explain structure as structuralism is that you have offices, right? You have the occupier of the chair. Now that occupier of the chair, it could be a cathedral where the bishop is literally sitting in, in the chair in Greek, cathedra is, means chair, right? You've got the idea of the king on the throne, who sits on the throne. Um, you have the idea of the chairperson which is a, just a disgusting term that used to be chairman, which is what it should be, right? So you have this idea of the, the chairman, the king on the throne, the, the bishop in the chair. So you occupy the office and with the office come certain powers, prerogatives, you know, authorities and access to information that allow you to perform whatever that function is. And to the extent that the office constrains and shapes, um, it really doesn't matter who's sitting in it. And that's a thing that all of us have observed and many of us have discussed, you know, ad nauseum. Um, and it doesn't matter who takes the presidency because the, the role and the functions and the aspects of it are constrained, at le least in so far as the holder of the office doesn't like, you know, really rear up on his hind legs and push his chest out, you know, um, and most people don't. Um, and even when some of them try to a certain extent, we've seen that there are there are limits to it. So what I've heard from you guys, it seems pretty solidly. You can tell me if you disagree, is that um, there's really a limit to what programmers can do in terms of their access to an office, because the office that the individual programmers or teams of programmers occupy has already been structurally constrained. Um, and so I'm hearing that loud and clear from you guys. But so to sort of keep with this theme of, you know, revealing uh, uh, Moldbug secret sauce, as it were, um, is it possible, you know, to, to instead of thinking about what powers come with the office, to instead think of what skills come with the office? which is indeed what we've been doing this whole time. Um, and or you guys have been doing this whole time to a considerable extent talking about how, you know, yeah, maybe the office and the access it provides, the authority that comes with it is strictly limited. Certainly we can see in the case of Moldbug, however, that, um, that the skills of the office can be applied quite usefully outside of its own dom domain. So, as I'm saying, this isn't anything new. You guys have already th thought about it clearly for you know almost two hours now. You've really been talking about this, but I think it's worth calling it out explicitly. What are the things beyond, for example, mold bugs simply saying, I see based on my skills. And so let me see and write um, what I have seen and share it so that others can see it. I think you could go a step further and say, what can we do? outside of our office with the skills that are native to that office, but applying them elsewhere. So, you know, I've actually had an easier time talking to you guys than all the clients in my history in terms of like thinking about, okay, let's just look at it a, a different way. 
like nobody choked up on me saying, look at historically how this thing is consistent, how it manifests in these different ways, because it seems all of you have to, as you've discussed, stand back and find and, and experiment with different models of abstraction that yield whatever the insight is that's necessary to get the damn thing done. Um, and so I'd open the floor to you guys now to say, if you had to think about what it is that programmers could really do well, that isn't necessarily programming. You know, you, you, you were talking earlier about how, um, how, for example, you know, there are very few people who have to do what we have to do in terms of, you know, making a thing work. And, you know, immediately in my mind, I thought of things like, because um, recently I was talking about it with a friend, the subject of um, mi mixing and mastering. You know, when you're mixing and mastering a finished musical composition, there's all this tweaking that has to happen. And you find that you've changed this that's happening over here in this frequency. And because the frequency of human vocals tend to overlap with these string instruments, you find out that they begin to get, you know, they begin to cram together and they don't work as well. That's one area um, where people have to confront similar problems. Another one is like military logistics. If you think about somebody like Eisenhower in World War II, you know, um, who's operating behind the scenes. He's not the fancy general, but he's the one who ensures that over here from production in the factories to, you know, trains and airplanes and ships to distribution and quartermasters is a massive system. And they're going to be these unanticipated um, cascading series of fuck ups that occur when you shift one or these other of uh, the things within this complex system. Um, so there are other um, classes and people and roles that have to confront some of these issues, but they're not quite the same. Um, and I, I, I don't think there are as many military logistics people ultimately as there are programmers, maybe good ones. Um, but uh, but so, so I probably talked enough, you know, opening opening the floor for this. What do you guys think? And, and maybe this will be our last major question. Um, and then we can turn to things that you guys think I might have missed that you want to bring up. Um, but how do you think the, the, the thinking and the skills of programmers can be applied outside their, their offices, so to speak, usefully for our purposes? Shall, shall I go first? Um, so I think you should think of programmers as the purest problem solvers. Um, in, in some ways, the scope of programming these days is so vast that to, to even consider them under one umbrella is is a slightly strange thing to do because the 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 actual subject knowledge you need to do each type of problem is is usually so specific that people you can hire a, a good programmer who who can learn the subject knowledge even the language you can you could take somebody who's programmed in never programmed in the language before and they could be productive very quickly um, you will find in offices, programmers will solve problems outside of the realm of computers. If there's like a broken window, <laughs> like that needs somebody to just like jimmy with it. And like pro programmers don't have any issues taking their problem solving and reapplying it to new fields. So we, we mentioned earlier in the stream, is it a deliberate tactic to give the busy work to the people in society who are pure problem solvers? And I think there is an element to which that you know, it's probably a conspiracy theory, but like it's interesting. But yes, if if you took programmers and said, you're not allowed to use computers anymore, can you do anything useful? The answer would be unambiguously, yes, they, they'd be some of the most useful people on the planet. Uh, th that being said, I th as I think I mentioned right at the top of the stream, there's a tendency for programmers to be pure problem solvers and not to take any interest in society. You think about the classic autism diagnosis, right? It's somebody who who is absolutely socially unaware. They don't understand tribes. They don't get politics. They don't. They're, they're sort of. Um, they're almost immune to a lot of the. <laughs> the problems that the rest of people, humans in society have, because they're, they're simply outside of their interests. And once they're given a specific problem to solve, they kind of have their blinders up like a horse, you know, they, they can only see the destination. So you can take a, a stat, like to, to stereotype a programmer, you can point them in the direction of a maths problem, or you can give them a, an accounting issue, or you can tell them, I need this bit of 
um, I, I need you to solve some theoretical physics problem. And they'll be perfectly content for weeks on end to, to just like sit there and work towards the goal. And then they'll be happy once they reach it, regardless of what, what difference it makes. Um, so all, all of that to, to loop around and say, I think the, the, it, the question for programmers is, is not whether they can reapply their skills, but how, how, do, we, how do we awaken enough of them to to choose to apply their skills to these problems. Let me let me ask this really quickly to all of you because I think it fits before we move on to the next person thinking about it. What it what is it that sets Moldbug apart as a programmer and gets him to do what he does when uh, so so when, when there's no other figure like him that that I'm aware of. There probably are, you know, but 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 he's well known. What is it that sets him apart? Would you guess? Um, he's unusually skilled in actually speaking and writing i mean he, he from a natural writing point of view his writing's a bit scattered but um it's lots of programmers scattered. might be out yeah so more than a bit scattered but from a, for most programmers they can think very clearly they can't communicate very well in the classic autistic way lambda was describing and well books kind relatively unique in that he can just talk for hours and end on these problems he's been thinking about so it's, it's, I suppose it's less his ability to think and more his ability to actually put pen to paper in a way that people can pick up and listen. So so he has a social API installed that many others don't. <laughs> yes, he <laughs> like. <laughs> That's hilarious. I think there's a component of chance to it too. That's, I mean, just briefly that like, I wouldn't, I don't think if it wasn't for Moldbug, I would have ever come across, I don't think I'd be reading Carlisle today, right? Like, I don't think I'd even come across it. You know, yeah. and now I have it. So I think at some point in his life he did. But I think that if I came across it on my own, by no means would it be anything like a mold bug. But I would be way into it immediately. Um, and so I think there's there is a component of just chance. You know, like he he has the right personality type. He had the right personality type. He had the right mindset. I'm sure lots of other people did. And he also came across these forbidden texts um, at the right time. Yeah, I think um, expanding our applying our skills outside of just programming. I mean, I actually literally did this today, somewhat in jest, um, but get uh, get other programmers to read things that don't have to do with programming. I think due to some of the autistic nature of this profession, you know, you get a lot of programmers who are really, really good, but they're very single-mindedly focused on programming and really don't know anything about anything else. But the way to actually convince programmers to apply their skills to other domains is just to actually just spark interest in other domains, um, which is what happened with, with Moldbug, right? And was what has happened with us is we're just interested in these other domains beyond just programming. Um, so I would just say, you know, try and, if you know any programmers, um, or you could just, you know, try and put forward this idea in general, is just to, to learn about things and problem sets that have to actually do with your culture and your history. And don't just, you know, if you need a book to read, uh, don't don't just read another programming book. If you're in like you know a programming club or or you know group of students at university or something, you know you can share these things that programmers would be interested in with them, and they will naturally uh, have an aptitude for it and become interested in it. So I would I would say that this just just getting other programmers to even be aware that they can apply their thinking to the problems they see in society um, that's a huge step right there. And then that chance process that you know happened with Moldbug will eventually happen again then there's the issue of a of a, a, a sorry lambda just very quickly there's the issue of the the motivation and the emotional aspect of it you know there's a certain distance and abstraction that goes with looking at problems in this way um, once again, you know, put the, the autism hat on it, if you will. Um, but this, so that kind of raises the question, and I'm sorry to do this, but it just comes up and I must ask. There's one thing that, um, it's one thing to say, to, to expose programmers to the idea that they can take an interest in these other things. But, you know, is, is there any way to, um, to imagine how one could con convey to them that they should? I don't think it matters, honestly. I think they just will. I mean, in my experience, even people that are pretty middling are by nature, and maybe we didn't push on this, I think most programmers by nature are just interested. And if you can see something that's true, they're going to be interested in it. Especially so if it's, it's something true that's different than they thought before. 
So it's kind of like sheep dogs, you know, you take a sheep dog and when it's not hurting sheep, you're walking it and it's keep, keep stopping and looking back to see if everybody's all in a group. I don't like how aptly that probably applies to me, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think a really interesting case to think about in, in with regards to this question is James Damore. Um, you, you could see he, he worked for Google and they started pushing some ideas about gender that he, I think, is he was a classic programmer as far as I can tell. That he, he was kind of just just beautifully naive to to the, all of the politics surrounding the question, and so he he took his normal abilities to to think about complex problems and to approach it completely scientifically, and he he wrote this like what was it like several hundred page or well it was at least dozens of pages um, Google document. And and he was merrily asking for collaborators. He wanted he wanted to get to the bottom of the question. He didn't see any anything in this question apart from just genuine intellectual interest. Um, Classic value but, neutral analysis. Yeah. So what happens? He almost immediately gets fired because <laughs> what do you, what, what what does Google want? A bunch of engineers starting to take an interest in these sorts of questions? No way. Um, so yeah, shut it down. Yeah. Sorry. If you yeah, if you want to imagine um, the way that programmers behave, James James Damore is I think very standard classic programmer. Sort of um, becomes obsessive over an issue, actually discovers the truth of it because they don't really care about you know finding the socially acceptable truth, um, and uh, but then is is kind of shocked by the the consequences if if they ever. So, so the, there's there's pros and cons to this. Like, if you try to wake somebody, a programmer, up to some of these issues, they may act imprudently for their own interests. Right in that typical way of an artist, you know, so to speak, yeah. just walk walk right into it and you know point your finger at it and say that's what it is because that's what it is, right? Wouldn't everybody want to hear it? And you suddenly find out, um, and no, no, they don't. Like Tober Mori the cat. Um, okay, so uh, did I kind of like uh, uh, dragged us off in, in an odd direction with those two specific questions? But was there anything that um, anybody wanted to cover in terms of how uh, uh, programmers can apply their skills outside of their domain that wasn't uh, hit or tapped on already? Um, just briefly, because I don't think a lot of programmers do do it, and it was basically what Charlemagne was saying, and it's just a slight extrapolation on top of that, is is networking itself. And I mean that like with humans. It's not really different than the stuff that we do with the machines. And like being able to identify and recognize people before they have impact that would have impact and people that don't. You know, like all of us can can know the people within our circles that are fake that are fake and gay and the people that are awesome. And and we generally know them early. And in fact, I lot, think a lot of people pay attention to streams like this because they recognize people when they're very small. Uh, you know, like when they have a very small following, they're just like, no, I like that. I'm going to listen to them. And I think that we can take our knowledge of that to help boost each other, essentially. Um, not to the benefit even of the person being boosted, so to speak, but to the benefit of like the community at large. I'm, I'm not trying to be a socialist. Right, <laughs> so, but, but a rising, so, a rising tide does often raise all boats. Yeah. yeah, but just just the networking component itself. And I think that's unintuitive for programmers because we aren't, we do have that lack of social thought generally. You know, like I don't, I don't think about it socially very often at all. In fact, I'm even having to force myself to do so right now. There's yeah, a, there's society. kind of an advantage also in the lockdowns for us if you are willing to be social because so many people are not social now. Um, if you're going to basket weaving or whatever, this presents you a huge opportunity to be the person that um, other people are socializing with, right? Like basically, uh, mo most people have just removed themselves from the market in terms of who people who don't know about these ideas can even talk to. Um, so, you know, when you, if you go to basket weaving or whatever, similar events, like I went to Walter Block's book club a bit, right? Even if you think the, the club might be kind of cringy, right? Um, which, you know, any Austrian economics club is going to be for sure. Just go anyway, right? That's part of the fun. Um, and, you know, actually do the IRL networking because uh, it's, it's extremely powerful to actually meet people in real life. And then you can do things like, you know, actually hand them a piece of paper or uh, a book to read or something like that if you want to even. 
And Maven, did you have anything you wanted to throw in there? Well, um, we're organizing an event at the end of August. Yeah, I gave you a nice uh, layout there. <laughs> exactly take, that. Take, take the stage, sir. Feel, feel free oh, to promote well. it. Yeah, so if, you, if you're in the UK, at least, go to Shielding's Events UK. And we have 13 speakers, including Lambda, on this panel. And we're going yes. to be talking about how to do positive, how to look at the future and how to where, where do we go from here, essentially. So the idea is not just to do analysis, mobile book style of what's happened, but to say, where, what do we actually do next? What's the practical steps? And um, look at what the right wing doesn't typically do, which is where, what do we actually, where do we actually want to go and end up? Normally, uh, people on our side, we can say, well, things were better in this part of the past and they were better here, but very rarely are positive visions actually presented. So those are the goals of the event. So if you're in the UK, please do attend. Yeah, as Dave said earlier, you actually need the understanding of what you're trying to uh, get to if you're actually going to take a migration path there. And if you read the re the essays I referenced earlier, um, Skeptical Waves has them on his channel, but you know the, the inflation economy on, on Grey Mirror and the FedCoin experiment, Moldbug clearly lays out first the state of affairs economically that he would want to actually get to. And then he lays out the path step by step to actually getting there. And you know a lot of what... Uh, the right wing does is, you know, we have a sort of vague conception of where we're going, but this is what programmers are know how to do as well is lay out a specification for what you're actually trying to make. And I think a lot of right wingers think they have a specification, but they actually do not. They don't even have anything close to a specification of what they're actually trying to implement. So this is another way that programmers can leverage non-programming skills as sort of the meta skills of programming, like writing a spec you know, help these various political movements write a spec for what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's definitely the case. That, 100%. That, like carrying over from even my own work, you you have to have a, a target. There has to be a goal. And, and, and that goal is meaningless if there are not explicit success criteria and milestones for it. So there's no way to tell whether you've even gotten to where you want to go unless you've identified it beforehand. And I think that that's just an overarching thing of people who have, um, I, I want to say professional, but I imagine it exists in the military and the rest. You know, you, you have to have success criteria and anybody who's experienced with project management knows that that's sort of first and foremost. And I think there's just a lot of pissing in the wind on the right because they, they don't, um, that a lot of them don't have exposure to that. They're people who, by their nature, um, are perfectly willing to say, "No, fuck you. This is ridiculous," right? But they're, but they haven't been exposed just to to basic things like project management or in in your world, you know, the specs that you're you're coding towards. Um, I I, I want um, to turn it over to you guys for any things that were missed. I'm kind of uh, sad that we don't have uh, skeptical waves because, as I recall, he had some interesting things that he had brought up about, you know, the difference between self-taught, you know, um, versus the, um, the, the product of the schools for the programmer and the, the nature of the personality differences there, you know, the programmer versus the hacker even, you know, which doesn't overlap entirely with that, but partially does. Um, so, but, but, but before I turn it over to you guys to cover anything that, you know, you think should be brought up that, that might've gotten missed. There's one thing I noticed in the chat, people were talking about smart contracts and I have some notes here. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't get into here, but it occurs to me that once the blockchain stuff comes in with all the smart contracts as well, you are likely to see the emergence of a hybrid beast that could destroy the entire planet because it will be <laughs> a, a, a crossbreeding of the programmer and the lawyer, which is, is some sort of just crazy. Um, I was incredulous hybrid. at first. Now I believe you. <laughs> yeah, it could literally destroy the entire fucking planet. Um, well, because you know, thing the I, do is work, I work with lawyers a lot myself. So yes, wait, that's coming. <laughs> yeah, but see, now you're do doing it because of the liability aspect, which means that you know I wouldn't even want to be anywhere near those meetings. I just wouldn't even. Mm. Or, or the specifications or requirements that come out of them. But I think that there's something even more evil um, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to combine the, the, the true inner nature of lawyers, which is always bad, um, with the kind of shirking, shiftless, shuffling, avoiding of responsibility and extending of deadlines 
and hiding behind the obfuscations of the fact that your manager doesn't know what's actually happening under the hood, you know, that you get with the, the IT people. Um, so yeah, does anybody have anything to say about the, uh, the, the, the crossbreed, the hybrid that I is mean, coming, the beast? On, on smart contracts themselves, they need to evolve quite a lot to get to that point. They're very basic at the moment. They kind of say if condition X is met, and that's a very uh, logical binary answer, then the contract will be fulfilled. So you have to, it's, there's not very, you can't write very strict conditions into that code itself on the blockchain. And if you were to put it out on some website or whatever, then you risk, run the risk of that entire contract falling apart. So, I mean, it, this future might come, but I think it's a third, more, more in the future than you might imagine, at least if it's going to be as part of the same financial system as uh, our, our money in general. Yeah, I see uh, someone, John Smith, just came in saying smart contracts have uh, very little to do with lawyers. They're just pro pro programmable transactions. Yeah, but the thing is, whether or not the transaction is allowed to go through is going to be shuffled together with legal requirements and the contract itself. You can say a smart contract doesn't have anything to do with law. It's just an if then. But the fact is that whether or not that if then gets triggered is going to be related to the legalese itself. And so I, I don't see I don't see a way around that unless any of you guys do. I will say, um, uh, yeah, go on. No, what I was just going to say is the whether it's triggered is based on um, if you to you have to put in the right numbers into the equation. Essentially, someone holds those right numbers, so it's always going to be a question of you know between these two parties what you think i don't know I, I don't think there's any way around this legalese if you everything was to go towards smart contracts but there's a uh, questions of do you actually want to do that because there's 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 some costs associated with it it's not blockchain doesn't always make things more efficient what, what i was going to mention was we, we've said lots of nice things about programmers this evening, but there are some things programmers are notoriously bad at. I think one of those is predicting which technologies will actually be of any use or interest to the rest of the world. There's a t tendency for programmers to get very wrapped up in whatever project they're interested in at that moment, and and they they see all of the reasons it's technically interesting and how theoretically it could provide some value to the rest of society, but that tiny tangential interest is is often not enough to give it the kind of impact on history that that programmers are anticipating so i would be um i would be cautious on getting too excited about technologies that are yet un, unproven e even if lots of very technical informed people are telling you that it's going to change the world. Um, of, often the things that change the world are not very technically interesting and the programmers <laughs> themselves find them incredibly boring. This is kind of like my, uh, I mentioned Urbit before we started. This is kind of my problem with Urbit is it's like, okay, yeah, yeah this is a really cool technology, but yeah, my username exactly. is literally a string of random letters. Um, <laughs> so I mean. The things that matter to normal human beings seem I I incredibly unimportant to programmers. Well, the, the obvious way you can see this is if you ever get a programmer to make a user interface for you, it will be this hideous, like, <laughs> so you're shaking your head, you've seen this. Like, well, I was just gonna say, it's it, 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 that is the issue when the, the UI and the UX people are like yeah. the API for humanity, so to speak, for everything yes. that's under the hood. And, and that's why, for example, Gab drives me crazy. You can tell that there yeah. are all programmers who put it together and you don't have people just saying, well, what's the human experience at the end of the day? It's Whereas like, well, Twitter, Twitter is fantastic at that, that latter aspect, which is why no one can yeah. um, knock them back. They, they have teams that think about just that. And the programmers are like, why think about just that? A, a programmer will genuinely think, why have people not adopted my new video sharing platform? It's peer-to-peer. -peer. The only downside is that you have to remember a 16-digit alphanumeric string to put in as the URL to get to any of the videos. But like, surely that's secondary to the coolness of the fact that there's there's no centralized server backing the thing. Whereas most users like any normal human being will, will understand that the thing that they care about be, more, more than... You know, it, their interest in how it's working behind the scenes is so low that they would care more about the color of the logo or like the font face that's used on on the page. Um, programmers just do not understand this. They, they, right. they're, they're like a different species in that regard. 
Right. Because the, the, the strength is the weakness. The weakness is the strength, right? Yeah, I mean, a, pr a programmer's day-to-day -day interface with a computer is so radically different from a normal user's that it's hard to understand. But in, in some ways, like most people are power users of computers. And I genuinely think it it was probably a mistake. In, in, not, not that this was a, ever a choice, but if only humanity could have got to a point where people were doing their day-to-day -day business using like writing simple uh, maybe maybe i'm wrong about this but i i think the I, I even question whether the gui is a positive development for if people are using a computer every day all the, all day they're so the the programs they use they're experts in it whether it be a spreadsheet or a word processing document this is a niche opinion that's probably not relevant to the stream <laughs> let's like, get rid of gui it this. should all be dos it should all be well, your, you know, command line interface or whatever. What I'm revealing here is my inner programmer because I momentarily <laughs> forgot about the existence of human beings who aren't programmers. Yeah. <laughs> so, there you go. I caught myself. <laughs> Always a risk. No, it's it's totally my programming computer doesn't have a mouse. It's just terminals. That's it. Yeah. And, and I love sorry, it. Sorry, ter terminals yeah. what I should call it. I'm all talking about DOS. What? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yep. So um, uh, anything else anybody wanted to um, uh, bring up that didn't get brought up? Or, you know, future directions for consideration? Anything, this, this, this is uh, your point to be able to step up and introduce anything that you thought was missed or that is worthy of attention, you know, since I've been trying to um, pro probably in an in insane way sheepdog this thing. There's, there's two things. This, uh, we talked about trying to get uh, people who can program and think in the partic that particular mindset to read things outside of their sphere and to start looking at other systems. The other way to look at it is to say, how do you get the normie to talk to the programmer in a way that the, the normie can understand and actually get useful information out of them? Um, so I, I don't know how you do that, really, uh, because I'm, I'm I'm more on the techie side. But I don't know, Sammy, you're, you're, you yourself, you're, you're talking to us programmers. How do you get other normies to do that as well? Um, you're, it, I think you're going to have limited success in it unless it's <laughs> someone who is accustomed to a degree of abstraction. I mean, that's my common denominator with you guys. There's certainly it's not the maths um, at all. Um, but uh, but I have found that I don't have any like I, I met Dave in the past and we just immediately started talking and it, it flowed nice and smoothly because I it, he got qualitative aspects that come from abstracting things um, and that kind of gave me a, a middle ground. Right. Um, so, you know, I can't ride with any of you guys, you know, uh, in terms of anything having to do with the math. Um, I can get into some ab absurd shit about syntax. Um, just because I'm into language and signs uh, and semiotics, but there's, there are even limits to that um, where my own approach to it introduces maybe more noise than uh, signal uh, for most programmers' tastes. Um, but anyway, the, the short version is I think you'd have to have you'd have to have somebody along who, by the nature of how they think or what they have to do, that they just naturally, are in the habit of saying, no, we can call it this, or we can we can impose this analogy or this metaphor. Um, and, and I don't know how many uh, classes of people do that. If I had to think about it a bit, I could probably come up with a few, but just you know, uh, shooting from the hip, none are really uh, coming to mind. Um, I don't know, but uh, do you got uh, other guys uh, uh, have any thoughts about uh, Maven's question, how, how you get programmers talking with uh, "Quote unquote normies." I mean, I'm, I'm sure half of you would just immediately say, "But the but the peasants are revolting," you know. <laughs> I, 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 I total, total silence. You're like, well, no, there's no fucking way we're going to talk to each other. <laughs> well, what conversations is is this for normies to be given information from programmers, or or is this for programmers to? receive information from normies well if you, if you want to affect societal change then you got to work mm -hmm. together right um i'm actually working on a video right now to explain the cathedral um and uh i basically do an explanation of what a graph is and i provide two examples of what a graph is uh because the cathedral is actually a graph 
Um, and we'll see how successful I am with this video. Um, I think I'm explaining what the data structure is um, and actually start at that level because I think it is necessary to start at the the level of data structure of, of graph because that, that is how Moldbug is thinking about the thing. Yeah. Um, so this will be an attempt, I suppose, to, to do what Semiagog is uh, suggesting here because I am actually trying in this project with lots of graphics to explain uh, this computer science abstraction uh, to normies. So uh, I agree that this must be done. We must uh, communicate to the normies in in the concrete terms that, that we think about these things. In. And uh, I guess uh, probably just talking to you honestly helps elucidate um, how that might work. I mean, everything you're saying about the ease of communicating with us because of the nature of understanding abstractions has been pretty interesting to me um, because I don't really listen to a lot of people talk about what it's like to talk about abstractions with people who don't already understand them, but apparently that's something you do. Uh, but most of the, you know, most of the people we talk with already understand abstractions because it's also their job to understand them. Mm. But also it has its limits. Like there's a guy, um, I he may still be watching. I've chatted with him a few times, Tom, he's in the, the chat. He's a programmer as well. And he came at with the, the idea of subject and predicate in the realm of computing. Um, and, uh, you know, this sort of thing. And uh, I, I choked up. So, you know, I, I have my limits. I'm like, wait a minute, that's not the same. How can that be a predicate also? You know, and there are ways that you abstract the abstraction further. And it's just like, but um, <laughs> yeah, there there is that. So um, uh, uh, just moving right along on things that you think we might have missed. Maven, did that cover the main one you, you wanted to do? Or is there anything further you wanted before we move on to uh, whoever's next? No, I think that covers me. Thank you, sir. Who 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 next? I'm happy to go. I'll beat you. <laughs> um, uh, I think that the I think that actually first off that idea sounds great, Charlemagne. I'm actually really excited for that. That's going to be super cool. Um, and kind of on that, I've tutored. I've done tutor just one on one tutoring for the last maybe six or seven years, um, and exclusively with people that had no programming experience at all, um, and it was remarkably successful. Um, and so I, I think that education is one of the areas where we could really um, move forward with just, I mean, just the general premise of like what's next and what can be done. Um, the education is terrible. I mean, the code schools are literally like they're almost negatives. You know, like right, right, like they, they really do. Like you go in at a zero and you come out at like a negative twelve. Um, and yeah. Yeah. and the universities, I don't think that's always the case. Um, but it often is and it's often despite the university that the people come out in fact they often go in fact lambda you actually answered a question on a stream last night of mine yeah <laughs> and you were you're totally right yeah you, you you're like yeah you kind of have to relearn you kind of have to recondition um and a lot of the people that I, I didn't go to university at all and a lot of the people that went that i've worked with that didn't were also were very um very good like the people that taught themselves were generally very good but they suffered a lot of the same pains i did um this will only strike some people correctly but when i was first learning i had no guidance i literally bought an xml book to learn how to program you know, like, <laughs> and was very confused wow. right like, you know like you just make these terrible mistakes and you're like what the fuck am i doing and so i think that's somewhere where actually we could go very fast and you could take people from almost nothing to pretty capable at a little bit where they have they can't go get a job or something but they have the, a, a new mindset and if they're interested in of their own accord, they have a syllabus effectively books that they can move forward with and people they can talk to. Okay, shall I, uh, shall I uh, go next? Um, indeed, oh, indeed. I was gonna s just say, I think you've done an excellent job shepherding Semiagog. Um, quite quite a difficult stream to run. And uh, so yes, m m much respect. Um, I think a couple of things it's, it's worth saying. One is that, Writing good code is, I think, a genuine good for society. If you're if you're a programmer and you're working for a company that is doing something useful, you 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 can consider yourself to be. I I often come across programmers who feel quite disheartened about their job in comparison to people who are face to face helping, like a doctor or a. Or so. But there there is genuine benefit to society to well written code and it, it it's 
because there's such a, a vast number of sort of drone like programmers, you actually can make a big impact, even if, if, if you're good and you can mentor a couple of people to be 10 times better than they are. That is a that is also a, 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 a so not just talking to normies as it were but like finding other programmers I, I think that's that's a valuable thing to do on the subject of um how education messes you up which is something that or, or the difference between self-taught versus um university taught that skeptical waves was going to talk about i i had one I, the, the, this is a whole stream in in and of itself really i i thought i'd give one I'd throw out one idea on this, which is on the sub on on the subject of um, data structures. I think that the types of data structures that people are led to through education are often the wrong ones. It's like they're, they're reaching for the wrong tools in the toolbox. Whereas self-taught programmers, are, in my experience, much more frequently reach for the right tools in the toolbox there are certain data structures which just fundamentally work really well they if you have sympathy for the the underlying hardware that you're working on if if you reach for certain tools you're going to produce code that's that's of high quality and we probably don't have time to go into like the detail i i'm itching to but I'm going to restrain myself. But I'm just going to say that there's a there's a whole interesting conversation on on that topic. Um, but I think it, it it's an example of how you can affect people's thinking if they spend time working with you and you can change their patterns of thinking. You can mean that the the output that they're producing is just higher quality. And fundamentally, competence is positive force in, in our society. I, I think we should see doing our jobs well, just that as being something worth doing. And you know, for many reasons, partly just the effect of it itself, partly people will look to us as, as thought leaders in general, like people will listen to us, we'll end up in more influential places if we can fundamentally do our job well. The types of projects that we spend our time on and that we lean towards will be more effective because we've had positive impacts on those projects. So for, for a whole raft of reasons, I, I think just doing our craft well and getting those around us to think correctly about things is, is well well worth doing. Uh, sh 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 thank you, Lambda. Charlemagne, this is your chance, and it, you can certainly put in a little bit of abuse for John D here if you feel. Huh. Uh, now I'll avoid. Uh, I'll avoid a uh, low level, low tier drama. Um, R rank like drama D. in your computer socks. Oh uh, yeah, rank. That was the uh, word I was looking for. Um, on that comment uh, that you just had on screen, actually, uh, maybe we should uh, just be doing kind of like academic agent just throws out these hardcore econ videos every now and then uh, maybe uh, various uh, programmers who make other types of videos or whatnot should just do some hardcore low level computer science. Like do people even know what normies probably don't even know what like a data structure is, even though we've mm. mentioned that a few times. Uh, so perhaps some just uh, preemptive education on these topics uh, would be useful to do and just sort of, make people watch it. Because I mean, if you put it in your feed, people are going to watch it. Um, they're not very likely, I would imagine, to go out and seek uh, programming videos from other randos that they don't already watch. So hmm. yeah, another secret <laughs> language panel. <laughs> So, I do yeah. like the I, I, I do like the idea of um, and and I'll get, open the floor back up to you, Charlemagne. If you have other things you want to mention, but um, I do like the idea of. Uh, Whatever the project is, you know how I talked about the the thing of the bells ringing and moving from room to room and you think, oh, that's just to facilitate the classes. No, that's the fundamental lesson, right? Mm. Um, or you think about, it's an example I often use of true and false tests, right? You think the true and false test has to do with the individual questions on the test and fuck all it does. A true and false test basically just ingrains the attitude in the students programs them, so to speak, to imagine that any given statement is susceptible to a T or F determination. 
mm. which is absurd when you when you want to step outside of binary thinking. But what you find is much like a Marxist dialectic, a true or false test inculcates binary thinking. I think in often in ways that are fundamentally procrustean, that cut it down to fit to suit your your hermeneutic schema. You know your 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 method of interpretation. So I, I say that to sort of underscore the possibility um, that I would love it if you all considered. I certainly can't do any of this because I, I don't have the chops. But um, but if you were to do a discussion that would open the world of programming to normies, I would love mm -hmm. to see it done in a way that implicitly, um, at the same time. Um, shows in the same way as like a true or false test or a bell ringing um, shows or, or, or fosters an awakening to their role as a class programmers themselves and tends to obliquely foster their politicization in, in, uh, in let us say the, the correct or the true direction to, to, to fall back in Manichaean dualis, dualism myself. Um, but anyway, I, I'm talking too much and it's probably not making uh, much sense, but there it is. Charlemagne, did you have anything else you wanted to, uh, to cover? No, I think I snuck in everything I wanted to talk about already. Then, well, then I would ask everybody uh, once again, is there anything else you didn't get to say or that you want to before we move to the opportunity for you all to shill your own uh, work? I don't think so. Thank you very much. It's been a good stream. Thank you, indeed. All right. Well, then, um, <clears throat> I would uh, I would turn it over to you. Let's uh, let's start with Dave, who doesn't have an online presence uh, of this sort, and I, I wish he did. Um, I guess there, there's nowhere to follow you, and everybody should not just really. Fuck off. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a, a true, bit. a true elitist. <laughs> yeah. No, I've, I'll probably have something sometime. Uh, I do actually write a weird AI mod for a flight simulator called Il2 Stromovic. Um, that maybe I'll link somehow into this. Um, uh, and I am actually if, working. If, if if you want to give that to me uh, in the chat, yeah. I'll pin it at the top. Um, or, but I, mean, I don't think it would the, really. In, I'm sorry. In the in the comments, not the chat. In totally, the totally. The video. Yeah, I'll hit it in the comments. I don't mean you'd you'd have to fl if you played the game, you probably already know it. So, um, and and not many people play the game, unfortunately. The uh, other thing would actually be connected to the last thing, which is I'm just about done with a with actually a programming course that is just itself a program, uh, where I've kind of taken the programs I used to do those tutors tutoring and kind of just amalged it up. It's just a little journal program and a thing that's effectively like a little VM runner. Like it runs a lot of little VMs, so you can test different stuff. And a this will interest some people. It's a pure LALR parser written totally in the shell. It's insanely <laughs> slow, <laughs> like insanely slow, but it's totally real. <laughs> um, and I'll probably try to start chilling that when I'm done with it. And I don't think it'll take too much longer. Sounds like Dave went anticipatory meta on us. So yeah. just a little. <laughs> Talking of projects which are very technically interesting, but pro probably don't <laughs> don't give the world. I mean, a, a shell-based implementation of anything is that is going to be um, <laughs> slower, right? Then uh... yeah, it's all shell actually. All the programs are. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. It's so people can rewrite the important parts in C or in a, a good uh, language. Okay. Okay. No, I see yeah. that actually. Yeah. Fair. Good point. Good pun. <laughs> Who's next? You're you're next, Vanda. Great. Uh, well, everybody should go and check out my uh, my current uh, key YouTube channel. Uh, as as people are discovering, I have a vast network of secret uh, channels, and um, he do, he does yeah, indeed. Pr pr probably half of the half of the channels you subscribe to, I'm secretly pulling the strings, but. <laughs> the one that I'm pointing to people to at the moment is Lambda Bible Studies, um, on which we discuss the Bible. So, um, yeah, c come and check it out and uh, get more Bible in your life. And Charlemagne? Okay, so other than my main channel on YouTube, Charlemagne, where I you know mostly discuss Neo Reaction, um, Burnham, things like that, uh, I also have a blog on Substack that's easy to find. It's just charlemagne.substack.com. 
Um, I'm working on more and publishing more often on that. Um, you know, sort of these things that don't really make sense as videos, I think, and it's just another way for me to output content for people. Um, I am working on that other video, as I mentioned. Um, and yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. You can find me there. My current handle is uh, what Charles Main Two. Uh, and of course, there's Odyssey as well. Um, I think it was the last video I did was exclusive there. So Odyssey is uh, basically my uh, other video platform. So YouTube, Odyssey, Substack, find me in those places. And before I turn it over to Maven, I do want to take this opportunity to promote uh, my uh, my uh, friend academic agents channel. I have uh, ultimately, if you you know track it back, I've poached much, much of the talent for this stream um, from him. Um, and you know, uh, talking with Jay Green River uh, sort of sparked my interest in doing this in the first place. Of course, Charlemagne has been uh, central to uh, this in terms of helping me pick out people to uh, to come on for the stream. But definitely check out uh, Academic Agents Channel. Uh, I recommend it very highly. Um, and now I'll turn it over to you, Maven, and um, certainly um, promote that event again. <laughs> I've already promoted the event uh, once, maybe maybe twice in the stream already, so I won't say too much. Just find me on Twitter. We will talk about it then if you're in the UK. And instead, I'll mention um, Skeptical Waves isn't here, and he publishes his own content as well. So if you enjoyed him at the start, you might be interested to know that he makes lots of text-to-speech uh, videos. Of, so if you like some of the thinkers we've been talking about on the stream, but don't particularly like reading. If you subscribe to his channel, you'll find a huge amount of content that's been voiced for you. So please do subscribe to him. Yeah, and he's a proper elitist as well, clearly, because he can't even be bothered to read the shit in his own voice. You know, he just turns it on and lets the machine do it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, definitely check uh, him out as well. Well, gentlemen, I, I want to thank all of you. This has been very, very interesting indeed for me. Um, and perhaps at some point uh, in the future, we can, you know, uh, determine some other dimension of this that needs to be looked at and um, and bring you guys back around. But definitely thank you all uh, very, very much. And to our audience, um, thank you for sticking with us. This has been the first stream where I've had this many people on. And uh, magically, it didn't... Um, it didn't turn into the ye old cascading series of fuck ups. I mean, even the dropping <laughs> out from the black helicopters was limited. So um, thanks all for uh, sticking it out. And um, until next time, I am uh, I am Semiagog, and I am 